When it comes to popularity versus screen time, there may be no bigger winner than Boba Fett. For decades, fans have been fervently buying action figures, comics, and novels featuring the world's favorite bounty hunter. Sorry, dog. People love Fett. Even though he has about four lines of dialogue in the entire original trilogy before being knocked into a giant pit by a blind guy. Because of his popularity and his limited screen time, it would be easy to think that Boba Fett doesn't have any hidden secrets. However, the truth is that there's still plenty you probably don't know about this mysterious character from a galaxy far, far away. His first real appearance most people know that Boba Fett first appeared on the big screen in The Empire Strikes Back. No matter what George Lucas did to the special edition of A New Hope later on, the real savvy fan may even be able to tell you Fett's first appearance on any screen was during 1978 Star Wars Holiday Special. Maybe I can help you. I am Boba Fett. But neither of those are actually the first time the public got to see Boba Fett. His first public appearance was a few weeks earlier, on September 24, 1978, at the San Anselmo County Fair. San Anselmo was the home of Lucasfilm at the time, and George Lucas thought that taking part in the local parade was a great idea. While Fett didn't engage in any pie-eating contests or hog-calling, assistant film director Dwayne Dunham donned the sweaty costume and signed autographs. Even though no one actually knew who Boba Fett was yet, all white. Even before Boba Fett took his unusual place in a local parade and a terrible holiday special, he'd been going through some changes. Concept artist Ralph McQuarrie had a ton of different designs for Boba that he was testing out. Ultimately, settling on the Mandalorian armor fans know and love today. The original suit was completely fabricated and screen tested, except it was completely Stormtrooper white. Sure, he still had a cool jetpack and sinister visor, but he was basically a bleached out version of the green and red guy of today. Why? Those original armor designs were originally planned to be old Stormtrooper armor from an old regiment, which would have made him look like a medieval knight marching into war with modern soldiers. But you know, in space. As plans for the film shifted and the lore began to grow, the armor became Mandalorian. Fett took a smaller role, and he finally got some much-needed color. The Big Bad According to an interview with Lucasfilm's first fan relations officer, Chris Miller, Fett was originally going to play a much larger role in the trilogy, which is why he had such a prominent role in the holiday special. At one point, he was even going to eclipse Darth Vader as the trilogy's biggest bad guy. As George Lucas became increasingly bored with space, he rewrote Star Wars from a dozen films down to three, compacted his entire second trilogy concept into Return of the Jedi, and threw Fett into a belching desert cloaca. Taking Action when Star Wars has an action figure controversy, and they happen surprisingly often, it usually revolves around Leia's gold bikini or too few rave figures on the shelves. But the original Star Wars action figure controversy stemmed from none other than Boba Fett. I'm the best bounty hunter in the whole galaxy. That's why you got the job. Let's recap. Fett's first appearance was at a county fair. His second appearance was in the holiday special. His third appearance, prior to the May 1980 release of Empire Strikes Back, was on the back of action figure packaging as a mail-away figure, when he still didn't have a backstory. Just one problem. The Fett figure was portrayed with a rocket-firing backpack. Star Wars fans, who were basically the original Turbo Nerds, were pretty upset at not receiving the action-packed Fett they were promised. Kenner had produced some prototypes of the full figure, which have since become the holy grail of Star Wars collectibles. But they were never released to the public due to safety concerns after a child choked on a missile from a Battlestar Galactica toy. Hasbro bought Kenner in 2010, and finally made things right when they released an actual rocket-firing Boba Fett as a mail-away in their vintage collection. Finally, adult nerds everywhere got their fondest wish, death by action figure, if they can just figure it out without killing each other. Just push. Push the button. Push. I'm pushing. Okay. Good God. Fett's many origins. Attack of the Clones made it absolutely clear that Boba Fett is the unaltered clone of legendary bounty hunter Jango Fett, the prototype for all of the galaxy's clone troopers. Unlike his helmeted clone bros, Boba is raised personally by Jango, and eventually takes his own place in the galaxy as a bounty hunter. But even before Attack of the Clones, the Star Wars expanded universe had developed a rich backstory for just about every weirdo in every scene of Star Wars, no matter how irrelevant. Even Ice Cream Maker Guy, 
Fun fact, his name is Will Rowe Hood. He's a rebel hero, he has his own action figure, he has a legion of fans, and in terms of screen time versus fan fervor, he just might beat out Boba Fett. Anyway, according to Tales of the Bounty Hunters, a novel released in 1996, Boba Fett's real name was Jasta Mareel, and he's essentially an ex-cop from the world known as Concord Dawn, who's exiled from the planet for killing his corrupt superior. Eventually, he's taken in by the Mandalorians and becomes Boba Fett. After Attack of the Clones, however, Jasta was rewritten to be a completely separate character from Fett. In the comic series Django Fett Open Seasons, Jasta Mareel was the leader of Mandalore, and the guy who took a young Jango Fett under his wing after Jango's parents were murdered. Occasionally, though, both Boba and Jango would use Jasta's name as their own, kinda like an intergalactic rusty Shackleford. He survived a fight with Vader. The original trilogy implies that Boba Fett and Darth Vader have a pretty okay relationship, but readers of Star Wars comics over the years have witnessed a rather unforgettable side to Vader and Fett trying to all-out murder each other. Sure, they're mostly non-canonical now, but that doesn't mean it's not fun to see. First, there's a fight in Star Wars Tales No. 11, where Fett actually holds his own against Vader in a lightsaber battle in a cantina. Vader and Fett faced off once again in Boba Fett Enemy of the Empire No. 4, where the stakes were a bit higher. In truly bizarre comics fashion, the two fight over the severed but still talkative head of a fortune-telling alien queen. Boba Fett is hired to retrieve the head in a box, but Vader wants it as a tool for his eventual overthrow of Emperor Palpatine. The two come to blows, with Vader deflecting blaster bolts and cutting Fett's getaway speeder in half, until he stops screwing around and force chokes Fett, who kicks the head off a cliff, and jetpacks to safety while Vader uses the force to retrieve it. The two only ended up having a pleasant work relationship later on because a decapitated queen head says they will, and Vader is pretty superstitious. But they probably also bonded over how difficult it is to go to the bathroom while wearing armor. 8 is enough You'd think that Darth Vader would have taken the record for the most actors portraying the same character on the big screen, between actors, last-second stand-ins, and voice actors not to mention stuntmen. But Boba Fett really wins that award since, for the most part, whoever fit into the armor got to play him. Jeremy Bullock played Fett through most of the character's appearances in the original trilogy, with the exception of two days, when he missed filming and the actor who played the rebel pilot Dak, John Morton, filled in. Throughout the original trilogy, Jason Wingreen provided his voice. For the special editions, he was dubbed by Tamora Morrison, the actor who played Django Fett. And when George Lucas needed more Fett footage for his special editions, he decided to just use three different industrial light and magic employees who happened to fit into the outfit. Finally, for the prequels, young Boba was played by Daniel Logan, who also provided the voice for Boba Fett in the Clone Wars cartoon. And we're not even counting video games, radio dramas, or Star Tours. King of the Mandalorians Though it's been wiped out by Star Wars' massive continuity overhaul, Boba Fett was once the leader of his entire planet of Mandalore, just like his father was before him. What's the name of the leader of all of Mandalore, the fifth planet in the Mandalore system? Quite simply, Mandalore. That word probably works for everything. It's like Aloha, Shalom, Smurf, or Squanch. Squanchy party, bro! Oh, Squanchy! Is there a good place for me to squanch around here? Squanchy, you can squanch wherever you want, man! The actual history of the Mandalorian seems to shift around a lot, but in the 2008 Star Wars novel Legacy of the Force Revelation, Fett's reluctant rise to power is spelled out clearly. He's hired to kill the existing Mandalore leader, Fen Shaisa who ends up saving Fett's life. But Shaisa is critically injured in the process. As a result, Fett is bound to honor his last request, that Fett himself become the new Mandalore. Of Mandalore. As such, Fett had the Mandalorians fight back against the alien Yuzhang Vong invaders in the novella Boba Fett, A Practical Man, and helped restore Mandalore after the war. Make Mandalore great again. Right? Fett's family. Another thing lost to Disney's revised continuity was Fett's family, which he started 16 years before A New Hope. It's weird to think of Fett as a doting dad, but he and his bounty hunter wife, Sintas Vel, settled down and had a daughter named Aelin when Fett was only 19. Unfortunately for everyone, Sintas is assaulted by Boba's boss, who Boba then kills, sending him spiraling into exile and divorce. Sintas ends up frozen in carbonite for four decades, and their daughter goes on a misguided quest to kill Boba Fett 
Fett herself. Not only that, but Aelin trains her own daughter, Murta, to follow in her footsteps, and you thought your family was messed up. All of that, and Boba Fett still found time to train the expanded universe daughter of Han and Leia, Jaina Solo. With the help of Fett and his granddaughter, Murta Gev, Jaina is able to kill her evil brother, Jason, and restore peace to the galaxy. So, no matter what reality you're following, Han and Leia have one really messed up evil kid. Those Skywalkers are bad news. The Star Wars universe is a rich tapestry, but there are times when it could have been even richer. From deleted subplots to abandoned action sequences, these are the Star Wars deleted scenes that could have had a big impact on the franchise. In A New Hope, we meet Luke Skywalker when he and his uncle Owen purchase C-3PO and R2-D2 from a group of Jawas. It's a fine introduction, and it allows the narrative spine of the film to carry through the two droids. However, deleted scenes from the film reveal that we were originally going to get to know Luke in a different way. George Lucas shot several minutes of scenes on Tatooine that were later cut from the film, which would have shown Luke doing much more than farming. In the scene, Luke sees the space battle that opens the film through binoculars and goes to show his friends what he'd seen. These scenes also introduced Luke's friend, Biggs Darklighter. Oh, Biggs is right. I'm never gonna get out of here. During their brief interaction, Biggs explains his plans to sneak away and join the Rebel Alliance. While the scenes would have slowed down the film a little if they'd stayed in, they would have also added a large amount of world-building and helped explain some of Luke's whinier tendencies. The Empire Strikes Back features a famous moment in which Leia plants a big kiss on Luke Skywalker to make Han Solo jealous. Take it easy. It works, but the moment is later undercut by the revelation that Luke and Leia are brother and sister. As it turns out, things could have been much more awkward. A deleted portion of the kissing scene takes place before Han enters the room, as Luke and Leia talk alone about his recovery. With his near-death experience on his mind, Luke begins to tell Leia how he feels about her. They almost share a more intimate kiss, but they're interrupted by C-3PO, because that's just what 3PO was born to do. The sequence would have also featured Luke revealing his plan to go to Dagobah to Leia, adding even more color to his inner life. Greedo was first introduced in what has become one of the most infamous scenes in Star Wars history, as a bounty hunter confronting Han Solo. But Greedo has a history. In The Phantom Menace, one of Anakin Skywalker's friends turns out to be a younger version of Greedo. In a deleted scene, we see that the kid was nasty from the start. George Lucas shot a lot of additional footage for Phantom Menace's pod race sequence, including more of the race itself and another scene set right after the race. The deleted scene shows Anakin and Greedo getting into a fight because Greedo accused Anakin of cheating. Their fight is broken up by Qui-Gon, who tries to explain to Anakin that he doesn't need to argue if he knows the truth himself. The scene underlines the anger within Anakin, and also lets us know that Greedo has always been a jerk. For much of Attack of the Clones, Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala are on her home planet of Naboo. They're supposed to be there for security reasons, but all that time alone together creates a romance. Deleted scenes from the film reveal that the Naboo trip included an extended sequence in which Padme discusses her political career. There's also an even longer scene in which Anakin meets Padme's parents. The sequence may have slowed the final film down a bit, but it adds a lot of depth to Padme. We learn that she wasn't raised as royalty, she loves quiet family life, and she's passionate about helping around the galaxy. We also see Anakin get grumpy when she tells her parents that he's not her boyfriend. One of the best things about the prequels is seeing the Jedi Order during their greatest days. That meant we got to see lots of Jedi beyond the few we'd met already. Sadly, the films have to cover so much ground that we don't get a chance to get to know most of these other Jedi. They're mostly supporting characters who barely get a word in. A deleted scene from the final battle in Attack of the Clones gave some of those supporting Jedi more to do. The missing scene is an action sequence in which Jedi Masters Kiandi Mundi and Plo Koon stage a raid on a droid control ship. The scene was never finished, but at least we got the Clone Wars. There's a lot going on in Revenge of the Sith. That means several deleted scenes fell by the wayside, and some of them follow the rise of what would become the Rebel Alliance. These deleted scenes paint a clear picture of a small group of worried senators discussing how to make a move against Palpatine. The stronger Palpatine gets, the closer they get to Rebellion. It's an intriguing subplot, and would have added quite a bit more context for the future of the Rebellion if it stayed in the final film. The Force Awakens has to carry on a story that ended on the big screen more than 30 years earlier, and set up a new story with a new cast of characters. That's a lot of ground to cover, and that means some aspects of the world-building are left to the imagination. One of these has to do with the Resistance, the Republic, and how General Leia Organa factors into both. 
Leia played a key role in the formation of the New Republic, but when the First Order rose, many people in the Republic leadership wouldn't believe her when she said it was a major threat to their future. So Leia founded the Resistance, determined to stop the First Order before they destroyed the Republic. In a deleted scene from The Force Awakens, this is given a touch more detail as Leia sends Resistance member Corsella to ask the Republic for help. Sadly, the scene was cut, and we only see Corsella in one shot, just before her death as the First Order destroys the Republic. The Last Jedi is the second film in the sequel trilogy, but the first in that trilogy to really deal with Luke Skywalker in a major way. Director Ryan Johnson had to not just introduce this new version of Luke, but also explain the complex emotions that led him to abandon his friends and the Force. It's one of the most important parts of the movie, but some things still had to be cut. One of the most powerful Last Jedi deleted scenes comes shortly after Luke figures out Han is dead. We don't get to see Rey and Chewie tell him that his brother-in-law and friend is dead, but one deleted scene shows us the aftermath. Silent and shaken, Luke sits down in his hut and tries to deal with the loss of Han. You can see the despair on his face, along with the guilt, as he wonders if things might have been different if he'd stayed. It's a wonderful performance for Mark Hamill, but it wound up on the cutting room floor. Star Trek and Star Wars are often looked upon as two sides of the same sci-fi coin, locked in a never-ending battle of philosophy versus action that will last until the end of time, or at least until the arguing nerds need a nap. In truth, both franchises probably owe their continued existence to each other. George Lucas admitted that Star Trek basically paved the way for Star Wars, and William Shatner conceded that Paramount only became interested in giving Star Trek a real shot on the big screen after Star Wars took the world by storm in 1977. Generally, fans pledge outright allegiance to one franchise over the other, but that's an idea that the following actors chose to ignore entirely. Here are a few actors who visited both the galaxy far, far away, and the Alpha Quadrant. George Takei Star Trek legend George Takei has been part of the Enterprise from the very beginning, first appearing as Lieutenant Sulu in the original series, and going on to reprise the role for six Star Trek feature films, video games, and even an episode of Voyager. But like many Star Trek alumni, it was through voice work that he made the transition between the two biggest universes in sci-fi. Takei became the most high-profile name to take the leap when he landed the part of General Luck Durd in the Clone Wars animated series. I congratulate you on your good fortune. When asked about appearing in Star Wars, Takei remarked that he didn't consider it to be jumping ship, telling comic book resources the Star Trek philosophy is to embrace the diversity of life, and Star Wars is a part of that diversity. Star Trek is science fiction, and Star Wars is more science fantasy. But with the episodes of Star Wars The Clone Wars that I worked on, I think there is a merging there. Star Trek and Star Wars living together in harmony? Oh my. Brent Spiner Another legend of Trek, Brent Spiner's run as Lieutenant Commander Data spanned 15 years. That includes seven seasons of The Next Generation and four feature films, one of which earned him a Saturn Award for Best Supporting Actor. He also played Data's brother, Data's creator, and even made an appearance in the prequel series Enterprise as Data's great-great-grandfather, so his place in Trek spans more than just one series. Spiner eventually put Trek behind him. At one point, he even publicly took issue with fans perception of the show, saying in 2011, We carry guns. It's a joke. It's like that illusion that it is somehow all about peace. It's really not. After provoking the wrath of Trekkies everywhere, Spiner's subsequent casting in Star Wars Rebels must have struck a nerve. The actor voiced Senator Gold Travis, a character who, coincidentally, is a total traitor. No kidding, Brent. No! Ethan Phillips Though he pops up in everything from Girls to Veep to Homeboys in Outer Space, Ethan Phillips' most memorable role remains Neelix, the USS Voyager's chef and ambassador. Phillips portrayed the Talaxian for the show's entire seven-season run, but he also made three minor appearances as different Star Trek characters. In Next Generation and Enterprise, Phillips played two different Ferengi, and he also made a cameo appearance in Star Trek First Contact as a holographic Metro D. Phillips has since become something of a regular in the world of Star Wars video games, providing the voice of transport pilot Hammond Flat in Force Commander. He also played an Imperial medical droid, Krantian governor, and Royal Grenade Trooper in 2002's Galactic Battlegrounds, as well as several additional characters in 2003's Knights of the Old Republic. 
Oh, hello to you. You're new to the Academy, aren't you? Simon Pegg. British actor Simon Pegg is known for many roles, from his zombie fighting hero in Shaun of the Dead to his recurring role in the Mission Impossible film franchise. But Trek fans know him as Montgomery Scott in J.J. Abrams' Star Trek reboot movies. He proved to be such an asset to Abrams that the director later admitted he had an ulterior motive when he cast him in the minor role of Unkar Plutt in Star Wars The Force Awakens, saying, When we were shooting The Force Awakens in Abu Dhabi, he was there as an actor. But for me, he was there as a writer and filmmaker. And as someone to go around the issues I was having at the time with the story and to get some great feedback. It probably didn't take much for Abrams to convince Peg to appear in the film either. Star Wars. I burned the Star Wars. <laughs> Pegg's input didn't end there either. He was also sought out by Paramount bosses when Abrams left the Star Trek franchise, bringing Pegg on board as a co-writer for the third installment, Star Trek Beyond. Ron Perlman Best known for playing the demonic anti-hero Hellboy, as well as his starring role on Sons of Anarchy and a few hundred voice roles, Ron Perlman has been around the block more than once. Many of Perlman's hundreds of credits lie in genre films, an area of cinema he's always supported. So when the opportunity came along to join the cast of 2002's Star Trek Nemesis as the Remin Viceroy, Perlman asked his manager for the time and place. While he enjoyed working on the movie, neither audiences nor critics seemed to share his enthusiasm. Fortunately, his foray into Star Wars received a much more positive reaction. Perlman voiced Garnacht, a Trandoshan scavenger who meets his untimely end at the hands of General Grievous in the highly acclaimed first season of The Clone Wars. Ed Begley Jr. Veteran actor and environmentalist Ed Begley Jr. is probably best known for his seven-year stint on Saint Elsewhere, though he actually has hundreds of TV and movie credits to his name. Among them are his appearance on the Star Trek Voyager 2-parter Future's End, in which he took on the one-off role of 20th century industrialist Henry Starling, who just happens to be working with a character played by Sarah Silverman. Begley Jr. has since said he felt really blessed to be a part of the Star Trek franchise, as a huge fan of the show. Though that didn't stop him from taking a gig with the rival franchise the very same year. He was hired to provide the voice of Boba Fett in the radio adaptation of Return of the Jedi, produced with the blessing of George Lucas. And speaking of Boba Fett, Jason Wingreen. A victim of the dreaded Star Wars DVD editions, Jason Wingreen saw his part as the voice of Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back chopped and replaced with the voice of Tamura Morrison, the man who played Jango Fett in the prequel trilogy. To add insult to injury, Wingreen was never actually credited for his contribution to the Star Wars universe, which only became common knowledge four years after the great remastering of 04. While he may be best remembered as Harry Snowden from All in the Family, for Star Trek fans he'll always be Dr. Linke, the Federation scientist who gets sent to the uninhabited planet Minara 2 to conduct studies in original series episode The Empath. Deep Roy the diminutive Deep Roy has an impressive filmography stretching back about 40 years, including two big-screen Star Wars installments. Roy played musician Droopy McCool in Return of the Jedi, a member of the Max Rebo Band, the 12-piece ensemble that performed in Jabba the Hutt's Tatooine Palace. The 4'3 actor actually appeared and credited in The Empire Strikes Back as a body double for Yoda during a number of scenes on Dagobah. Roy is also one of the very few actors to appear on screen in both franchises, playing Scotty's oyster-faced alien sidekick Keenser in the rebooted Trek series. Keenser was never even meant to join Scotty on the franchise's most famous starship, but Roy's performance was so memorable that they invited him back to reprise his role. Clancy Brown Sci-fi fans shouldn't really need an introduction to Clancy Brown. He's played the immortal antagonist, the Kurgan in Highlander, Mom. and Sergeant Zim in Starship Troopers. Even your kids know Clancy Brown, if only in voice. Donate to the children's fun? Why? What have children ever done for me? Despite an impressive sci-fi resume, it wasn't until 2002 that Brown showed up on Star Trek, taking on the role of Zabral in the Enterprise episode Desert Crossing. In it, Archer and Tucker accept an invitation to his homeworld, and unwittingly find themselves caught up in a war. Among his countless voice roles, Brown also dipped into Star Wars territory when he played Darth Maul's brother Savage Opress in the Clone Wars series, as well as Ryder Azadi in Rebels, who only kind of looks exactly like him. Clive Revel 
Renowned stage actor Clive Revel portrayed a tweaked version of classic English character Sir Guy of Gisborne in 1991's Next Generation episode Cupid, which took the crew to the 12th century world of Robin Hood. While it wasn't the most memorable performance the New Zealand native has given over the course of his distinguished career, at least it wasn't replaced in later edits like his work on the original Star Wars trilogy was. Sorry. Revel supplied the voice of Emperor Palpatine in the first cut of The Empire Strikes Back. But like so many others, his work was dubbed over for the 2004 DVD release, replaced with the voice of Ian McDermott, who took over as the Emperor with Return of the Jedi. Revel was humble about the change, however, conceding that continuity was important and saying that the filmmakers made a good choice with McDermott, considering that the original 1980 Emperor was played by a woman with superimposed chimp eyes. Pretty much anything was an improvement. Greg Grunberg As a self-proclaimed geek, Greg Grunberg couldn't have asked for a better friend than a man who rebooted Star Trek and kickstarted the third Star Wars trilogy. Grunberg has worked with J.J. Abrams almost exclusively, so when Abrams began his cinematic reinvention of Star Trek, he called on Grunberg again, drafting his friend to overdub the dialogue for James Kirk's stepdad. Hey, are you out of your mind? That car's an antique. You think you can get away with this just because your mother's off planet? You get your ass back home now. He appeared in person as Commander Finnegan in 2016 Star Trek Beyond, though by that point he had already crossed the franchise divide. Brumberg played resistance pilot Snapper Wexley in 2015's The Force Awakens, though he later told StarTrek.com that he's on the fence about which franchise is his favorite. Olivia Darbo. Darbo! <laughs> Best known to Trekkies as Starfleet Academy intern Amanda Rogers from the Next Generation episode True Q, Olivia Dabo. Dabo! Dabo is probably best known for playing Kevin Arnold's hippie sister Karen in The Wonder Years. Believe it or not, Dabo, Dabo! considers herself to be a pretty big sci fi nerd, telling the official Star Trek website, I considered it a real honor to be working on the continuation of the Star Trek legacy I'd grown up with. It had a huge effect on my childhood, and not unlike Star Wars, it made me more curious about space, other life forms in our galaxy, and the wonder of astronomy in general. In 2008, she joined a number of her former Star Trek colleagues at Lucasfilm to record the voice of Luminara and Julie for the Clone Wars animated series. And, oh yeah. <laughs> Patty Maloney Emerging from the darkest day in Star Wars history is Patty Maloney, who played a part in the infamous and totally bizarre Star Wars Holiday Special. The 3 foot 11 actress was hired to play the special's main character, Chewbacca's son, Lumpawaru, better known as Lumpy. No, seriously. <laughs> Maloney's memories of the especially weird program were completely positive, saying, We were all very pleased with the outcome of it, actually. I was. I was very pleased with it. The special aired in 1978, and because of the sheer shame involved, was never seen again in any official capacity. Maloney's role in Star Trek was another one created for a person of her stature. In the 1996 Voyager episode, The Thor, she plays one of the many creations of the clown, a manifestation of fear born of a linked neural network. Because, you know, sci-fi. This time, she's credited as only Little Woman, which is still a huge improvement over being a grunting idiot named Lumpy. Added bonus, it was even a speaking role! Oh boy! And she got to hang out with Michael McKean. Point, Star Trek. Okay, we're taking that point back. When it comes to the Sith, the big bad villains of the Star Wars universe, there's more than one way to skin a Jedi. Some Sith were strong in the Force, while others wielded sinister magic or huge political influence. So who comes out on top when you add it all up? Here are the most powerful Sith ever. Freedon Nad. Freedon Nad was a Jedi in the days of the Old Republic, with Force talents far beyond any of his peers. While training, he became jealous of his Jedi Master's power and authority. So, in true Sith fashion, he killed him, and renounced his affiliation with the Jedi. Man, what a baby. Nad was trained in the ways of the dark side by Naga Sadao, a Sith Lord living in exile. After his death, Freed and Nad's ghost continued to manipulate events from beyond the grave. Marka Ragnos 
Mark Aragnos, was a Sith Lord who grew tired of the Sith's unwillingness to expand beyond their homeworld of Korriban. His reign was ruthless and brutal, but most of the time, he achieved victory without raising a finger. A master of manipulation, Ragnos set his adversaries against one another, using their mutually assured destruction to clear an easy path for the Sith. And his story didn't end with his death either. As a Force ghost, he pitted Sith Lords against each other for the honor of becoming the official Dark Lord. You will merely call me Jedi. Darth Bane Darth Bane is the Star Wars Expanded Universe's version of a founding father when it comes to the dark side of the Force. As the last surviving member of the Sith Brotherhood of Darkness, Bane started a new Sith Order and decided to pass his knowledge on to a single apprentice, establishing the rule of two that the Sith Lords have followed ever since. The Sith killed each other, victims of their own greed. But from the ashes of destruction, I was the last survivor. I chose to pass my knowledge on to only one. Darth Vader As Anakin Skywalker, the man who had become Darth Vader, was expected to become the most powerful Force user of all time as he had the highest midichlorian count ever recorded. I heard Yoda talking about midichlorians. I've been wondering, what are midichlorians? Uh, let's not get into that. But anyway, after massacring the students of the Jedi Academy, Anakin was severely wounded by his master Obi-Wan Kenobi, and as the cyborg Vader, he lost some of his connection to the Force. Still, he had perhaps the most impressive power of all, terrifying generations of moviegoers. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Darth Nihilus The dark side of the Force can be seen as a metaphor for addiction. Darth Nihilus offers a perfect example. After he was caught in the detonation of the superweapon known as the Mass Shadow Generator, which destroyed the planet Malachor V, Nihilus' body was wrecked. He was left with an insatiable craving for Force energy, essentially turning him into a Force vampire. Yikes. Revan Like so many other Sith, Revan also started as a Jedi. He turned to the dark side after the Jedi Council refused to protect the lives of Outer Rim innocents caught in the Mandalorian Wars. Over their objections, Revan assembled a large Jedi defense team, helping the Republic win the war, but leading him down the dark path to corruption. He eventually embraced the light side again and helped defeat the Sith. I've known both sides of the Force, light and dark. Darth Sidious Better known to most fans as Emperor Palpatine, Darth Sidious rose to power thanks to ruthless cunning. After murdering his master, Dark Plagueis, the Emperor hid in plain sight as the benevolent galactic senator from Naboo, secretly orchestrating the Clone Wars, which allowed him to consolidate political power. Darth Sidious corrupted Anakin Skywalker and virtually wiped the Jedi out of existence, turning the table after thousands of years of Jedi dominance over the Sith. I'm afraid the deflector shield will be quite operational when your friends arrive. Darth Vishet The original Emperor, Darth Vishet tricked the other Sith Lords into helping him perform a ritual that allowed him to absorb the life force of every other living being on his home planet. The ritual granted Vishet immortality and immense power, which he used to found a galaxy-spanning Sith Empire, ruling it with an iron fist for 1300 years. I have forged this empire to surmount all of my previous works, to span eternity. Yeah, Palpatine had his moments for a few decades, but when it comes to Sith Emperors, there is really no contest. You can't beat a dude with 1300 years under his belt. I am awakened, and I bring with me death. As anyone familiar with series creator George Lucas's original Star Wars screenplay would tell you, the process of making the first film so special involved throwing a lot of bad ideas away. So while most of the series' worst moments are confined to the three prequels, the movie that started it all had plenty of cringeworthy material going into it, which many of Lucas's collaborators wisely fought to prune. Appearing on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson shortly after the Star Wars mania had begun to sweep the nation in 1977, Mark Hamill shared his own contribution to the script's improvement, revealing one clunker of a line from the original screenplay he talked Lucas out of. The dialogue was a little bit difficult. I remember there was one line that I just begged him to take out of the screenplay, and he finally did. Boy, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I sometimes dream about this line. 
The passage in question came up during a scene in which the crew of the Millennium Falcon comes across what remains of Princess Leia's home planet, Alderaan, after it's been destroyed by the Death Star. The line Hamill protested came as a response from Luke to a remark by Han Solo, which Hamill quotes for Carson with a charmingly gruff Harrison Ford impression. And Harrison says, look, kid, I've uh, done my part of the bargain. When I get to an asteroid, you, the old man, and the droids get dropped off. That line in and of itself wouldn't have been too out of the ordinary for the swashbuckling spaceman. But what would have come next was pretty ridiculous. And my line was, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquila or Solus. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. Even in a script filled with confusing exchanges, that one was too much for Hamill. And I thought, who talks like this, George? <laughs> the line would have still been far from the worst bit of dialogue ever to be uttered in the series, but you can see why Hamill wouldn't want to try and deliver those words. Hamill remembered pleading for the line's removal out of a sense of self-preservation. This is really not fair because, you know, <laughs> we're the ones that are going to get vegetables thrown at us, <laughs> not you. The presence of the planet names Aquilae and Solist in the convoluted line serves to demonstrate just how much got chiseled away from Star Wars script on its way from page to screen. In the original story treatment, Aquilae was a fleshed out planet with the real world parallel of communist North Vietnam. By the time the movie was shooting, the names had been reduced to a reference for the sake of world building. When Hamill prevailed in removing the one line they appeared in, he deleted the planets entirely. The line that haunted Hamill isn't the only part of Star Wars original script that needed work, and Hamill's not the only actor who had issues. Harrison Ford, who plays the space pirate in the film, at one point threatened to tie George up and, and uh, make him say his own lines at gunpoint. While the cast's complaints with the script may have caused some friction, their efforts worked to sand down Star Wars' rough edges, making it so most of the worst stuff never made it out of the editing bay. It all goes to show that when it comes to collaboration, compromise is king. Otherwise, you get the Phantom Menace. And how many great lines can you quote from that? It's a big sea monster. <laughs> no, Jar Jar Binks is terrible. The galaxy's scruffiest looking nerf herder finally got a film all to himself, with Solo a Star Wars story. And as far as all out action filled heist movies go, it's out of this world. Taking place about a decade before Han would meet Luke and his crew in a dingy little cantina on Tatooine, Solo gives us a pretty clear backstory about the troubled, optimistic Han. Despite the hero's general detachment and disenchantment from all things Jedi, it's hard to escape common threads dangling throughout the Star Wars universe. From name checked bounty hunters, to familiar face masks, here are a few details you may have missed in Solo. Stay Golden You'd be blind to not notice Han's gold dice in Solo, but they have a very confusing history, and even canonical Star Wars publications can't seem to agree on what their deal is. From their first on-screen appearance during A New Hope, the dice have taken on a life of their own. Star Wars The Force Awakens, a visual dictionary, includes a picture of the dice. They have standard pips, and they were allegedly used in a game of sabacc in which Han won the Falcon from Lando Calrissian. When they make their reappearance in The Last Jedi, their symbols have changed to alien characters. In Solo, Han hands the dice to Kira, before they're separated on Corellia. The dice are returned to him just before the crew of the Falcon enter the spice mines of Kessel, but they definitely aren't used during Han's Sabacc showdown with the cheating Calrissian. They're not even used during Han and Lando's rematch in which Han actually scores the iconic ship. So like so much of Star Wars lore, we're going to have to dig just a little deeper and figure out the real story behind those Corellian chance cubes. Questions about Kessel Finally, we get to see what makes the Kessel Run so dangerous, and why it's such a big deal that Han Solo made it in less than 12 parsecs, setting to rest the ongoing debate about a parsec being a unit of distance, not time. Because of the fancy flying necessary to make it through the extremely dangerous area of space, finding a viable shortcut and surviving it is a truly big deal. Most viewers remember Kessel because of Han's boasting. The average run takes 20 parsecs, but the Falcon made it in 12. That is, if you round down. By the time a new hope rolls around, Han's story story grows and that number dips to under 12. During The Force Awakens, Rey believes the number to be 14 parsecs, which Han quickly corrects. But that's not even the first time Kessel is mentioned in Star Wars. The first mention occurs in the first five minutes of A New Hope. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel. In Solo, we see that Kessel totally sucks. Even though L337 staged a pretty successful robot rebellion in the mines, Star Wars Rebels The Visual Guide confirms that the mines have regular rebellions, all of which seem to be more or less unsuccessful. 
Even a decade later, Kessel still sucks. Big Bounty Of all the lives lost in Solo, the definitive end to a fan-favorite bounty hunter was perhaps the most surprising, and it didn't even happen on screen. Ara Singh, who made a brief appearance in The Phantom Menace, went on to appear in both canonical Star Wars comics and multiple episodes of The Clone Wars, where she hung out with Boba Fett and Cad Bane and even faced down Jedi warriors Ahsoka Tano and Plo Koon. And then, sometime later, she was pushed by Tobias Beckett and met her unceremonious end. That's it. For a once-respected bounty hunter, what a way to go. Also mentioned in passing is Bosk, the lizard-like bounty hunter who first appears in The Empire Strikes Back. Diving even deeper into Star Wars lore, the Zan sisters are also mentioned at the same time as Bosk. While not an obvious riff on Star Wars Legends continuity, Zan and Zoo Pike were a pair of mercenary sisters who first appeared in Shadows of the Empire. If there's any doubt about their connection, consider Teros Kasi, the martial art mentioned by Kira, which is employed by her, Voss, and Darth Maul, among others. It's first mentioned in Shadows, is used by the Pike sisters, shows up in the title of a terrible video game, and is never mentioned in canon again until now. Legends even though Disney threw out pretty much every Star Wars comic and book that was written before they acquired Lucasfilm, much of the new canon continuity of Star Wars is more or less a remix of the old stuff. At one point in Han's original wiped-out history, he joined the Empire, didn't fit in, and eventually saved Chewbacca from the Empire's abuse. Sound familiar? <laughs> That's yes. The Maw also exists in old Star Wars lore, but it's a cluster of black holes inside the Kessel Run. The idea is essentially the same in Solo, plus a horrifying space jellyfish for good measure. The parallels to things viewers can find in the discarded history of Star Wars are numerous, but you'll still never, ever see Mara Jade on the big screen. Sorry, guys. Crimson Dawn Dryden Voss, the leader of the crime syndicate Crimson Dawn, is something of a collector. Keen viewers probably noticed a suit of Mandalorian armor hanging around in the background of his office, which is of course similar to the suits worn by the Fets. But it's another curiosity in his office that probably turned even more heads. Director Ron Howard announced before the release of Solo that he'd planted an Indiana Jones Easter egg in the film, carrying on a long tradition of the two franchises' trading references. Treasures from the Sankara Stones to the Fertility Idol are hidden throughout the room, but the most obvious treasure is the gigantic crystal skull that Voss has prominently displayed. Voss's skull is definitely more humanoid than the alien cranium found in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but it's almost definitely a reference to the Indiana Jones film. Aboard the Falcon for decades, all we've really known of the Millennium Falcon is that it's a temperamental, hardy little freighter with a weird shape. But you might not have even recognized the ship in Solo. During Han and Lando's first trip, we see that the ship is very clean and also unusually teardrop-shaped, with a whole lot of additions made by Lando himself to make it more of a pleasure vehicle than one for just serious business. These additions include a cape room, a hollow chess table, and some nice sleeping quarters. Interestingly, the shape of the old Falcon actually reflects the original designs of artist Ralph McQuarrie. Despite all the damage by the end of Solo, one thing we know for sure remains aboard the Falcon is Lando's bounty hunter helmet, which we first see in Return of the Jedi when Lando enters Jabba's palace using the name Temtel Screech. Beckett uses the same helmet to disguise himself on Kessel. Digging Deep Lando clearly isn't a fan of mining colonies, but by the time The Empire Strikes Back rolls around, Calrissian is managing Cloud City, a Tabana gas mining colony over Bespin. Keep your eyes peeled on the Falcon and you'll spot a silver model of the colony among Lando's possessions. Speaking of clouds, it may also come as a surprise that Enfys Nest and her cloud riders actually aren't a completely original creation for Solo. They're actually inspired by a band of marauders who appeared in 1978's Star Wars No. 9, but only in appearance. The comic cloud riders are led by a guy with the terrible name Arrogantis, who definitely isn't into piracy to help the rebellion. By then, Marvel's Star Wars comics were already far off the rails. Jabba the Hutt was a skinny yellow walrus on two legs, while Han was hanging out with a hedgehog man named Hedgie and a barely clothed crime boss lady named Amaza. No thanks. Weasel and Company Solo doesn't have as many secret cameos as other recent Star Wars films, but a few are worth mentioning. It would be hard to miss the unusual presence of Clint Howard, brother of director Ron Howard, and a regular face for fans of science fiction. You'll spot him as a robot wrangler when we first meet L337. And while you won't find C-3PO, Solo still features the droid's actor, Anthony Daniels, as a human named Tok, who teams up with the Wookiees and Chewbacca during the escape from Kessel. And of course, we have Warwick Davis, who's been a part of Star Wars since the very 
very beginning, most notably appearing as Wicket, the Ewok. Of all his Star Wars characters, only one is unmasked. Weasel, a scuzzy spectator at the Boonta Eve pod race during The Phantom Menace. Davis appears again in Solo as a member of the Cloud Riders, and once again he's playing Weasel. Going from a racing junkie on a dirt planet to being one of the galaxy's founding freedom fighters is an arc to parallel anyone else in Star Wars, and it's an arc we'd love to see. On May 25, 1977, a pop culture phenomenon was born. After months of hype, a movie called Star Wars hit theaters. But what was it really like seeing the film back in 1977? We've gathered accounts from filmmakers, journalists, and fans to take us back to a galaxy far, far away. While it took a week or two for Star Wars fever to fully catch on nationwide, it was an overnight sensation in California. The film premiered at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, where it became completely normal to see lines of fans camped outside the movie house. Actress Carrie Fisher told Time Magazine, It wasn't like a movie opening, it was like an earthquake. The Chinese Theater was at the epicenter of that earthquake, and thousands of fans were drawn to it every day. Speaking to CNN, Star Wars fan Chris Baldock recalled traveling from the San Fernando Valley to Hollywood to see the movie on May 26th, just one day after the film opened. The long line wound down the street from Grauman's Chinese Theater and around the block. News helicopters hovered in the air above the crowd. Star Wars was the first film to earn a reputation as a party movie. The fans brought costumes, beach balls, folding chairs for the line, and an almost palatable anticipation. There was no better place to see it than Grauman's Chinese in its pre-multiplex days. On advice from 20th Century Fox, the owners of the famous theater only booked Star Wars for a two-week run. When a scheduling conflict meant they couldn't show the hit film after that, they resorted to desperate measures and refurbished an old cinema. Larry Gleason, former president of Man Theatres, told The Hollywood Reporter, We moved Star Wars there, where it played for two weeks before coming back to the Chinese. Star Wars toys would explode in popularity over the next couple years, but back when the film was first released, the toys weren't ready and all kids had was the movie itself. George Lucas's film became so popular with youngsters that some of them were even ditching school so they could see it. A lifelong fan, Patrick Payne, told StarWars.com, Unless you lived through it, and can remember, it's kind of hard for modern audiences to understand just how different the world was in 1977, just prior to the release of Star Wars. I had seen the trailers on TV and in the theater months earlier. They didn't say much. However, what little they showed had already triggered my imagination. Payne sought out the novelization of Star Wars, which had hit the shelves in November 1976. After reading the book, he knew that he absolutely had to see the story play out on the big screen. Payne recalled that a little thing like class wasn't going to stand in his way. I, for one, was not going to miss this movie even if I had to miss school. Therefore, I skipped school sorry parents, took the bus downtown and saw the very first show on opening day. Another young film enthusiast who saw the film on opening day was Brad Bird, who would later direct such hit films as Ratatouille and The Incredibles. He described to CNN what happened in the theater when Darth Vader appeared on screen for the first time. And the audience simultaneously boos and hisses like it's a silent movie. In the mid to late 1970s, there weren't a lot of movies with broad, cross-generational appeal being released, which is another reason why Star Wars did so well. Speaking to the official Star Wars website on the 40th anniversary of the film's release, artist Paul Bateman revealed that his father wasn't really interested in seeing a space movie at first, but he ended up having the time of his life. Bateman fondly recalled, when we arrived at the theater, the line to buy tickets was around the block, and Dad was bored waiting in the line. However, not too long after the opening scenes, my dad became just as engrossed in the film as I was. He was cheering and reacting along with every adult and child in the audience. California native Fred White had just turned eight years old when Star Wars came out, and despite knowing absolutely nothing about the film, he was hugely excited when his father told him they were going to see it. White reminisced about that day to CNN. He said, It's called Star Wars. I clearly remember thinking, Star Wars, that's a weird name. We saw it that day, and I never thought it sounded weird again. Like so many kids his age, Star Wars became a huge part of White's childhood, and he has shared a special bond with his dad since that day. They even started a Star Wars tradition and went to the opening day of the next two films together. 
One of the reasons Star Wars managed to stay in theaters for so long was because people were returning for repeat viewings. There was even a healthy competition breaking out among the fledgling fandom. When the topic came up on Reddit, one user recalled seeing Star Wars over a dozen times. The Redditor wrote, It was absolutely the coolest thing ever. Saw that sucker 14 times that summer. First movie I ever went to see more than once. What do you want to do tonight? Oh, and if you say see Star Wars again, I'm leaving. <laughs> you don't want to leave. Another Reddit user recalled seeing it at least once a week for the entire summer after getting his initially reluctant friends hooked on the film. When it finally made it to the discount theater, we went as groups every weekend through year's end. Of course, going to see a movie isn't free. It's all well and good when you're an adult with a job to support your new Star Wars obsession, but how did kids in the 1970s manage to see the film so many times? Well, 13-year-old Russell Burgess and his friend Scott maximized their budget by getting three showings for the price of one. He admitted to CNN, We rode our bikes seven miles to the biggest cinema in our area, waited in line three hours, and then sat through three viewings in a row, hiding behind the screen curtains and in the emergency exit stairwells while the theater was cleaned between shows. In a passionate Medium article, Star Wars fan Rob Connery said that seeing the movie in theaters at age nine was a life-altering experience for him, reminding younger film fans just how unique it was at the time. According to Connery, it wasn't just the visual effects that made Star Wars unlike anything people had seen before, it was the whole package. He wrote, most movies you would go see as a kid were kind of crappy. I remember really liking Escape to Witch Mountain and Herbie movies, but as I grew older, I wanted something more, more adventure, and yes, a little bit of suspense and scariness too. We just didn't have that back then. It was all goofy Disney Trek. That all changed when Star Wars came along. According to Connery, it was the perfect escape activity for the pre-internet age, when kids didn't have endless entertainment at their fingertips. Connery added, There was absolutely nothing like Star Wars when it came out. I'm struggling to come up with some relevant analogy for movies today, something that makes you jump up and scream, that alters your life profoundly and makes you believe in space travel, exotic alien planets, and the Force. Much like Connery, fans from around the globe had their eyes and minds opened to endless possibilities by this film. You've taken your first step into a larger world. Patty Hammond, creator of the Everyday Fangirl blog, won tickets to see Star Wars from a local TV station. The trouble was the theater was a 40-mile round-trip journey from her family home. Hammond wrote about the experience for StarWars.com. Back then, the freeway system was not what it is today, and a trip to the theater took over an hour. However, with Dad being a big science fiction fan, we decided to do it. Lucas's space opera more than lived up to her and her father's expectations. Hammond elaborated. When we came out of the theater, he said, Mark my words, this movie will become a classic. Boy, did he predict that one. Of course, back then, it wasn't uncommon to drive to a movie and see it without ever having to leave your vehicle. Star Wars played as a double feature with Smokey and the Bandit at a number of drive-in theaters, including one in Kansas, where CNET's Bonnie Burton was watching in awe from the back of a pickup truck. Burton remembers with wonder the experience of seeing Star Wars outdoors. I can't adequately express the fun of watching Skywalker blow up the Death Star on a big screen beneath a sky full of twinkly stars. As an imaginative kid, it was hard to see where the Star Wars galaxy ended and our own night sky began. After that experience, I'd stare up at the sky throughout my childhood, hoping to see the Millennium Falcon zip by Earth on its way to Coruscant. One of the reasons that Star Wars got such an enthusiastic welcome in 1977 is because there wasn't a whole lot of joy at the time. George Lucas's debut feature, THX 1138, was a dark, gritty sci-fi experience, but he grew up adoring characters like Flash Gordon and wanted to capture that type of magic with an uplifting tale of good versus evil. Lucas's vision apparently didn't go down well among veteran sci-fi writers who didn't want to see the genre watered down for younger viewers. August Ragoni, who saw the movie on opening day, told Tested, they hated that Star Wars legitimized sci-fi. But at the time, we needed Star Wars. We had a recession, we had an energy crisis, and we needed some serious escapism. It was the perfect adventure movie for a kid and the kid in everyone. 
According to Rigoni, Star Wars lifted and connected people. The longtime sci-fi fan also said, it was a moment in time and a shared experience that happened in cities all across America. It caught everybody off guard and something like that hasn't happened since. Even veteran broadcast journalist Walter Cronkite spoke highly of the film when he was interviewed for the documentary Empire of Dreams, the story of the Star Wars trilogy. Cronkite had this to say, George Lucas's Star Wars lifted us out of our depression of the 70s and into an awareness and focus on space and its possible future. This movie stood by itself. Lucas himself had a similar perspective on the film and why it was so successful. It's been a long time since people have been able to go to the movies and see a sort of straightforward, wholesome, fun adventure. Believe it or not, some people weren't that into Star Wars when they saw it on the big screen in 1977. While many veteran film critics such as Roger Ebert waxed lyrical about the film, some of his peers were definitely not impressed. Joy Gould Boyum wrote in the Wall Street Journal, There's something depressing about seeing all these impressive cinematic gifts and all this extraordinary technological skill lavished on such puerile materials. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's hard to understand now, but some viewers were so underwhelmed that they actually walked out of the film. Speaking to StarWars.com, fan Denise Steele revealed that she watched the majority of the movie alone at a theater in small town Mississippi after her friends decided to get up and leave. We arrived a little late, as usual, just as R2 and 3PO were walking across the sands of Tatooine. About 15 minutes later, my friends declared the movie to be lame and walked out. I stayed by myself and fell in love with Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Princess Leia. I met with them again the following night and again the following weekend. Although it's tame by today's standards, for some younger viewers, Star Wars was actually a little too violent. In the UK, one young girl complained about the scene in which Alec Guinness's Obi-Wan Kenobi protects Luke and slices off Ponda Baba's arm with a swift stroke of his lightsaber. It's exciting, but I didn't like the bit when the man chopped off um, the person's arm. Why not? In the Because there was blood. The Star Wars saga has become a sprawling epic, spanning numerous planets, alien races, and massive cosmic battles. In fact, there's so much stuff happening that sometimes it's hard to keep it all straight. And that's why we're here to explain the entire Star Wars story. The Star Wars story begins during a period of relative peace in the galaxy. A thousand years before the events of the Skywalker saga, the Jedi Order defeated the Sith Order, seemingly for good. While the Jedi became the keepers of peace in the Galactic Republic, the surviving Sith secretly began plotting to overthrow them. It was near the end of this millennium of peace that Darth Sidious, a Sith Lord who was secretly Senator Sheev Palpatine of Naboo, set in motion his plan to eradicate the Jedi and seize control of the Republic's government. As part of his plan for galactic domination, Sidious acted as a secret advisor to the Trade Federation, ordering them to blockade and ultimately invade Naboo. Once the Trade Federation arrived on the planet, Sidious slipped back into his Senator Palpatine disguise and advised Naboo's queen, Padme Amidala, that the current Chancellor of the Republic wasn't acting in their best interests. Working with his Sith apprentice Darth Maul, Sidious was able to manipulate and manufacture tensions in the Republic from both sides. Meanwhile, on a mission to protect Amidala, two Jedi Knights, Master Qui-Gon Jinn and his apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi, happened upon a young Anakin Skywalker while repairing their ship on Tatooine. Qui-Gon discovered potentially unprecedented levels of Force sensitivity in the boy. After taking Anakin with them, Qui-Gon urged the Jedi Council to train Anakin, but the Jedi were reluctant. After Qui-Gon's death at the hands of Darth Maul, the Council accepted Anakin as Obi-Wan's new apprentice. Palpatine was elected Chancellor at Amidala's urging, granting him a place of unprecedented power to further his plans. Following the events of The Phantom Menace, tensions within the Republic continued to rise under Palpatine's leadership. Anakin Skywalker grew into a young Jedi Knight of considerable Force talents, and finally, Darth Sidious took on a new apprentice, former Jedi Count Dooku, who adopted the Sith name Darth Tyrannus. Dooku, at Sidious' urging, created tension in the Republic by forming the Separatists. As numerous star systems threatened succession, now Senator Padme Amidala fought to keep the Republic together and was nearly assassinated for her trouble. Obi-Wan was dispatched by the Jedi Council to find out who was behind the attempt on her life, while Anakin stayed behind as her bodyguard. What about Senator Amidala? She will still need protecting. Handle that. Your Padawan will. Anakin. Obi-Wan's investigation uncovered an army of clones, seemingly ordered for the Republic by a dead Jedi Knight. This discovery led Obi-Wan to discover a Separatist gathering on the planet Geonosis. 
Back on the Republic capital of Coruscant, Chancellor Palpatine was granted emergency powers to use the newly discovered clones in the fight against the Separatists, launching the Clone Wars. During this time, Anakin and Padme fell in love, and Anakin's internal anger grew as he discovered the death of his mother on Tatooine. The Clone Wars raged for three years, with Dooku as the figurehead of the Separatist movement and Palpatine as the increasingly powerful Chancellor of the Republic. The war raged across the galaxy, consuming system after system as everyone picked sides. The Jedi Order were tasked with joining the conflict as generals of the clone armies discovered during Star Wars' Attack of the Clones. As the conflict raged, Padme remained a force in the Senate, working for unity while mistakenly believing she could trust Palpatine. Obi-Wan and Anakin fought on the front lines, and Anakin even took on a Jedi apprentice named Ahsoka Tano. During this time, he and Padme fell deeper in love, and they married in secret. However, as the war went on, Anakin's darker tendencies grew. Ready for the final stage of his plan, Palpatine allowed himself to be taken prisoner by Separatist General Grievous. This kick-started a rescue mission, leading Obi-Wan and Anakin to infiltrate Grievous's ship to rescue Palpatine. Once inside, they found Dooku, and in the battle with the Sith, Anakin killed the Separatist leader at Palpatine's behest. With Palpatine rescued, the Republic pressed their advantage in the war, and Yoda and Obi-Wan were both sent to the front lines in an effort to finish the conflict once and for all. Back on Coruscant, Padme told Anakin that she was pregnant, and his dreams became troubled by visions of his wife dying in childbirth. Anakin grew even closer to Palpatine, especially after the Chancellor hinted he might have knowledge that could prevent Padme from dying during childbirth, or ever. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? To push his plan into its final stages, Sidious revealed himself as a Sith Lord to Anakin, while also promising him knowledge of the dark side. Anakin reported Sidious to Mace Windu, who attempted to arrest the Sith Lord. During the battle, Anakin chose to save the Sith, all in the hopes that Sidious could save Padme's life. With Mace Windu dead, Anakin pledged himself to the service of Darth Sidious in the hopes he could prevent Padme's death. Sidious dubbed his new enforcer Darth Vader and then ordered him to slaughter everybody inside the Jedi Temple. This began the Great Jedi Purge under Sidious's Order 66, which required all clone troopers to terminate their Jedi generals on sight. Only a handful of Jedi like Obi-Wan and Yoda were able to fend off their attackers. Meanwhile, in the Senate, Palpatine used his power to declare the Jedi outlaws and turn the Republic into the Galactic Empire. To end his self-orchestrated war, Sidious sent Vader to the planet Mustafar to kill the remaining Separatist leaders and shut down the clone army. Then, Obi-Wan and Yoda made their move. Obi-Wan went to fight Vader on Mustafar while Yoda confronted Sidious on Coruscant. Unfortunately, Padme reached Vader first, and when she tried to convince him to see the error of his ways, he nearly choked her to death. By the end of Revenge of the Sith, Sidious fought Yoda to a stalemate, while Obi-Wan defeated Vader and left him to die. After facing the Sith, Obi-Wan and Yoda regrouped with Senator Bail Organa of Alderaan. Clinging to life after her husband nearly killed her, Padme gave birth to twins named Luke and Leia before passing away, leaving the children effectively orphaned. Leia was adopted by Organa and his wife, while Luke was sent to Tatooine to live with Shmi Skywalker's relatives, the Lars family. Obi-Wan moved to Tatooine to keep watch over Luke, while Yoda moved to the swamps of Dagobah to live in solitude. In the absence of the Jedi, Emperor Palpatine quickly consolidated his vast power with Vader by his side. However, even as he celebrated his victory, a small group of leaders were already sowing the seeds of rebellion. One soon-to-be rebel leader was Han Solo, a Corellian orphan living on the streets and working for a local crime lord. When he failed to escape the planet with his girlfriend, Kira, Han enlisted in the Imperial Navy. After three years, Han deserted and joined up with an outlaw named Beckett to earn a new life for himself as a pilot. His journey led him to reunite with Kira, now a trusted lieutenant in the Crimson Dawn crime syndicate. Together, they embarked on a journey to steal a valuable shipment of coaxium fuel for Crimson Dawn boss Dryden Boss. Along the way, Solo met his best friend, Chewbacca, and obtained his trademark ship, the Millennium Falcon. At the end of the adventure, Kira chose to betray and leave Han, leaving Han to work as a smuggler for the next decade. In the years after the Great Jedi Purge, the Empire tried to exterminate any former Jedi still in hiding. Meanwhile, a small band of Resistance leaders grew more and more organized, and the Rebel Alliance began to take root. Nearly two decades after the fall of the Jedi, there was a breakthrough thanks to Galen Erso, a Rebel sympathizer who'd been forced to work on the Death Star. Erso planted a key flaw in the Death Star that would allow the Rebels to destroy it. During an all-out battle at Scarif, Jyn Erso and Captain Cassian Andor give their lives to steal the Death Star plans. Nearly 20 years passed between the end of the Clone Wars and the Battle of Scarif, and during that time, Leia Organa and Luke Skywalker had grown up on their adoptive homeworlds. 
Leia, now Princess of Alderaan, was a key member of the Alliance and managed to flee Scarif with the Death Star plans. When she was captured by Vader, she hid the plans in R2-D2, who escaped to Tatooine in a pod with his counterpart C-3PO. On Tatooine, the plans fell into the hands of Luke, a farm boy with dreams of being a rebel pilot. After viewing a message from Leia directed at Obi-Wan Kenobi, he sought out the old man, and when the two met up, Obi-Wan revealed he was once a Jedi Knight. Determined to get the plans to Alderaan, Luke and Obi-Wan booked passage aboard Han Solo's Millennium Falcon. Unfortunately, Alderaan had been obliterated, courtesy of the Death Star. After our heroes found Alderaan destroyed, the Millennium Falcon was pulled into the Death Star's tractor beam, giving Luke, Han, and Chewbacca the opportunity to search for Leia, while Obi-Wan disabled the station's tractor beam. A battle broke out as Luke, Han, Chewie, and Leia shot their way out of the station, while Obi-Wan dueled Vader in a long-awaited rematch. Sadly, the Sith Lord killed Obi-Wan in front of Luke. Back at the Rebel base on Yavin 4, the Alliance formed a plan to assault the Death Star. Luke volunteered to join the fight, while Han left with the reward money he'd earned rescuing the princess. At the last moment, Han returned to help in the battle, shooting Vader out of the sky and leaving Luke free to destroy the Death Star. With the help of the Force, Luke saved the Rebel base and handed the Empire its biggest defeat yet. Three years later, Vader finally located the Alliance base on Hoth and launched a full-scale assault, prompting a Rebel evacuation. Han, Leia, Chewie, and C-3PO fled in the Falcon, while Luke left with R2-D2 in his X-Wing to seek Jedi training from Yoda on Dagobah. The Falcon made its way to the gas planet of Bespin, where Solo met his old friend Lando Calrissian, who unwillingly gave the Falcon and her crew up to Vader. Luke, sensing his friends were in danger, went to Bespin against Yoda's wishes to save them. After the bounty hunter Boba Fett froze Han Solo and Carbonite to take him to Jabba the Hutt, Vader and Luke fought in a lightsaber duel. During the fight, Vader cut off Luke's hand and revealed that he was his father. Devastated and heartbroken, Luke leapt away from Vader rather than join the dark side, but fortunately, he was rescued by Leia, Lando, and Chewie. Months passed as the team developed a plot to rescue Han. Both Leia and Lando infiltrated Jabba the Hutt's palace while in disguise, but Leia was captured after getting Han Solo out of the Carbonite. Luke sent C-3PO and R2-D2 ahead as gifts for Jabba before entering himself. Jabba managed to capture Luke and tried to have both Luke and Han executed by throwing them into a Sarlacc pit. Luckily, Luke had hidden his new lightsaber in R2-D2's body, and with the help of Han, Chewie, and Lando, Luke destroyed Jabba's bodyguards. Meanwhile, Leia strangled the giant worm with her own chains. After rescuing Han, Luke returned to Dagobah to find Yoda dying. After Yoda's passing, Obi-Wan's Force Ghost informed Luke that Leia was his sister. Determined to complete his training and restore the Jedi, Luke returned to his friends. But in the midst of the war, the Empire had constructed a second Death Star. The second Death Star was fitted with a shield around its entire exterior, generated by a satellite dish located on the forest moon of Endor. The Rebel Strike included a covert attack to destroy the shield generator, along with a full-scale fleet assault to destroy the Death Star itself once the shield was down. Luke, Han, Leia, and Chewie led the Endor team, while Lando, Admiral Akbar, and Wedge Antilles led the fleet strike. Meanwhile, Luke turned himself into Vader so he could face his father alone on the Death Star. As their battle commenced, Vader brought Luke before the Emperor, who attempted to convert the young Jedi. Luke resisted Palpatine's control and fought against Vader. However, after realizing he was becoming just like his dad, Luke refused to kill Vader. Enraged by this, the Emperor tortured Luke with Force Lightning, which led Vader to pick up his master and throw him into the station's reactor core. On Endor, Han and Leia destroyed the shield generator with the help of the native Ewoks, and the Rebel fleet completed its mission, destroying the Death Star and effectively ending the Galactic Empire. As the new Galactic Republic began to form with the help of major Rebel Alliance figures like Leia and Mon Mothma, the remains of the Empire retreated to the Outer Rim. There, they fell under the command of a mysterious Force user named Snoke. The ashes of the Empire then gave birth to the First Order. Meanwhile, Han and Leia had a son, Ben Solo, who showed the Force prowess of the Skywalker bloodline. Luke made good on his promise to rebuild the Jedi and started a temple where Ben was a student. Unfortunately, Snoke began to influence Ben, and the young Jedi turned on Luke, converting some students and slaughtering others. Heartbroken, Luke went into exile. Sensing the threat of Snoke and the First Order, Leia formed an underground movement separate from the Republic, a group known as the Resistance. With his military commander, General Armitage Hux, Snoke developed a massive system-killing weapon known as Starkiller Base. Meanwhile, Ben Solo, now known as Kylo Ren, sought to find Luke Skywalker. Skywalker's location was hidden on a piece of star map obtained by Resistance pilot Poe Dameron and hidden in his droid BB-8. The droid was ultimately found by a Jakku scavenger named Rey. 
together with a First Order deserter named Finn, Rey stole the long-dormant Millennium Falcon and left Jakku, only to run into Han Solo and Chewbacca. While stopping off at the planet Takodana, Rey discovered Luke's original lightsaber before getting kidnapped by Kylo Ren. With Han and Chewie's help, Finn was able to return Luke's map to Leia and the Resistance. General Leia Organa and the Resistance launched a desperate attack to destroy Starkiller Base, while Finn, Han Solo, and Chewbacca tried to rescue Rey. While there, Han confronted his son Ben. Hoping to prove to Snoke that he truly turned to the dark side, Kylo Ren murdered his father. Up on the surface of the base's planet, Rey took up Luke's lightsaber and defeated Kylo Ren with her newly discovered Force powers. After the battle, Rey journeyed with R2-D2 and Chewbacca to a remote island on the planet Octu, prepared to ask Luke for guidance. Following Starkiller Base's destruction, the First Order sent a fleet to the Resistance base on Dakar. Poe Dameron led a massive attack on the First Order fleet against Leia's wishes, losing most of the Resistance's fleet in the process. While the Resistance fled, Rey found Luke was unwilling to offer her any assistance. Rey was ultimately able to convince Luke to help her, but Rey began sharing secret, Force-connected conversations with Kylo Ren. Ultimately, Luke and Rey had a falling out when she tried to convince him that Kylo was capable of redemption. Rey fled the island while Force Ghost Yoda burned down the First Jedi Temple with Ghost Lightning. Leia and Vice Admiral Holdo staged a last-ditch effort to save the Resistance from the approaching First Order. On Snoke's flagship, Rey allowed herself to be captured so she could try to convert Kylo, who initially seemed to be on her side. Rather than watch Rey die, Kylo betrayed his former master and killed Snoke. But after fighting Snoke's guards together, Kylo asked Rey to join him in ruling the galaxy. The Jedi, the Rebels, let it all die. Rey, I want you to join me. Rey declined and fled to the Resistance on Crate. After Vice Admiral Holdo flew the Resistance flagship into the First Order fleet, crippling their starships, new Supreme Leader Kylo Ren led a ground assault on the last of the Resistance on Crate. There, Luke based down the First Order assault and bought the Resistance time to escape on the Millennium Falcon. However, the Luke on Crate was a Force projection, while the real Skywalker was still back on Ock 2. The strain of projecting his consciousness across the galaxy was too much, and while the Resistance lived to fight on, Luke became one with the Force. As Rey trained with Leia to further develop her Jedi abilities, the Resistance discovered that Emperor Palpatine had returned. Palpatine made Kylo Ren an offer. Kylo could rule the galaxy as a new Emperor with the help of a long-hidden fleet of planet killers if he agreed to kill Rey. Meanwhile, the Resistance went in search of a Sith Wayfinder, which could point the way to Palpatine and stop his fleet before it launched. As her anxiety built during the mission, Rey discovered a new layer of darkness in her. Rey's anxieties over who she was built to a peak when Kylo Ren told her that he knew her true heritage. She was the granddaughter of Palpatine himself. After learning the truth, Rey nearly killed Kylo in battle, but healed him after Leia intervened to save her son with her dying breath. Luke's spirit urged Rey not to give up, and Rey journeyed to Exegol to confront Palpatine. There, the revived Emperor revealed his true plan to convert her to become the new Empress and leader of the Sith. Rey refused his offer and fought Palpatine with the help of a redeemed Kylo Ren. In the end, both the Emperor and the fleet were defeated and the galaxy was saved. In the aftermath of the battle, Rey forged her own lightsaber and buried those of her teachers in the Tatooine Desert. Finally, she revealed that she had taken a new name, Rey Skywalker. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Even without the iconic prologue crawl or that classic a long time ago text that precedes most entries in the saga, most people could be dragged into a theater showing a Star Wars film they've never seen and still know exactly what they were watching within moments. Here's why. Something really, really bad always happens pretty much every time a bottomless shaft appears in a Star Wars movie. If the saga's heroes had any sense at all, they would have learned by now that whenever they walk into a room with a bottomless shaft, they need to turn around and run the hell away. Qui-Gon meets his violent end at the foot of one of these impossibly long tunnels in Phantom Menace. Both halves of Darth Maul plummet down one of those shafts, just like Darth Vader hurls the Emperor down one in Return of the Jedi. Luke miraculously survives a drop down Cloud City's bottomless shaft in The Empire Strikes Back, and opens Obi-Wan hops over one to turn off the Death Star's tractor beam in A New Hope. The heroes of Rogue One also climb up one to get hold of the Death Star plans. And then there's the Force Awakens. Frankly, Han should have known better than to walk out over one. The shafts of Star Wars are legion, and if you see one, you're probably in big trouble. Star Wars movies tend to be bad for limbs, and probably very kind to black market prosthetics dealers. Someone loses a limb in most entries, and whether you're watching the movies based on theatrical release or in chronological order, it's not going to take long before someone loses something very important to them. 
Darth Maul loses everything below his waist in Phantom Menace and is revealed to have survived the ordeal in the Star Wars The Clone Wars animated series, even making a cameo in Solo A Star Wars Story. Anakin Skywalker says goodbye to the first of many soon-to-be-lost limbs when Count Dooku relieves him of an arm in Attack of the Clones, and he loses the remaining arm and both legs in Revenge of the Sith. No major characters lose limbs in A New Hope, though Obi-Wan does leave a canteen of Bully's bloody arm on the bar, and later Later loses his entire body, if you want to count that. Luke takes off a Wampa's hairy arm in Empire Strikes Back, his father sends Luke's hand spinning down a shaft later in the film, and Luke pays him back by taking off one of Vader's already replaced hands in Return of the Jedi. Neither of the newest trilogy's released entries feature limb loss, but both had deleted scenes with amputations. Chewbacca tears off Unkar Plutt's arm in a snipped Force Awakens scene, and The Last Jedi originally had Captain Phasma's hand sliced off by Finn just before her death. First introduced in Empire Strikes Back, Yoda has proven to be one of the most popular and oft-quoted characters in the Star Wars mythos. From his first scenes in Empire, the Jedi Master earned a reputation as a near-bottomless font of wisdom. Great warrior! <laughs> Wars not make one great! <laughs> Although with the advent of CGI and the release of Attack of the Clones, the Syntax Challenge Jedi was able to prove himself a badass warrior as well. But Yoda's also part of a Star Wars tradition that doesn't begin or end on Dagobah. Almost every entry in the franchise includes at least one character like Yoda. Someone who initially seems physically unimpressive, but ultimately proves to not only be an expert warrior, but a source of great wisdom, and usually information about the mysterious Force, even if the character isn't a Jedi. A New Hope gave us Obi-Wan, the oldest hero in the film's ragtag group, who nevertheless easily saves Luke from Ponda Baba and later fights Darth Vader in a lightsaber duel. Yoda fills the role in both Empire and Return of the Jedi, as well as appearing in all of the prequel films. Chirrut Imwe is arguably the most formidable hand-to-hand -hand combatant to appear in Rogue One, as well as being the most vocal supporter of the Force in the film. The enigmatic Maz Kanata plays part in the newest trilogy, even though her connection to the Jedi, if there is any, hasn't yet been revealed. People have a lot of fun flying in Star Wars. That's not to say they shouldn't have fun, especially since they're usually just a few minutes away from having their arms chopped off and thrown down a bottomless shaft. Why not make the most of it? But it's still kind of remarkable just how much fun they're having. And there's an almost endless stream of wahoos and yeehaws to be heard throughout the saga's many stories. And they usually happen in the cockpit of a spaceship. Whether it's Han celebrating finally taking out a TIE fighter, or even the young Anakin Skywalker belting out the occasional wahoo while threading through Trade Federation droid fighters, Star Wars heroes really like to yell, even when they're having a really bad day. Take Finn, who when he first escapes the clutches of the First Order with Poe, is wahooing up and down the dark void of space as he and his new buddy both narrowly escape death. While the Star Wars galaxy boasts a wide variety of planets, the planets themselves don't tend to offer a wide variety of climates and terrains. In fact, the worlds of Star Wars tend to be planets of extremes. While our own Earth has a few deserts, for example, if there's a desert on a planet in a Star Wars film, then it's likely because the entire planet is a desert. Like the reoccurring setting of Tatooine or Force Awakens Jakku. If there's ice and snow on the planet, there's ice and snow everywhere like the frigid planet Hoth in the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. There's the swamp planet Dagobah, the ocean planet Kamino, and the volcano planet Mustafar in Revenge of the Sith. The final location in Return of the Jedi is even referred to as the Forest Moon of Endor, in case visitors aren't quite sure of what extreme and singular environment they should expect. Speaking of extreme planets, how about this? No matter what the story is about or who the lead character is, the Star Wars saga just keeps on bringing us back to one of two desert planets. Usually it's Tatooine, though Tatooine is replaced by the equally desolate and arid Jakku in The Force Awakens. Even The Rise of Skywalker is posed to add the Star Wars roster of desert planets with the strange rocky world of Pasana. Now, it is a little surprising that Tatooine in particular features quite so much in the Star Wars mythos, if for no other reason than a series set in a galaxy chock full of planets inhabited by intelligent life keeps swinging back to the same dry ball of sand. Well, if there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. While the question of Tatooine's specific connection to the Force has yet to be directly addressed in the films, it would be surprising if its reoccurring appearances had nothing to do with a strong connection to the Force. From Luke's training on Dagobah and Empire Strikes Back and Rey's time spent on Acto and The Last Jedi, 
We know certain places in the universe are particularly strong with the Force. Considering Tatooine is the birthplace of Anakin Skywalker, the childhood home of Luke Skywalker, and the decades-long hiding place of Obi-Wan Kenobi, it's probably fair to say that the place has at least some kind of significant connection to the Force as a whole. The universe is a big place, and the Star Wars galaxy hides many titans. Star Wars boasts enough giant monsters to fill the cast of any decent Godzilla flick. Unlike most of the monsters in Godzilla, though, Star Wars titans are weirdly good at hiding, especially considering their size. Often, these monsters even appear as naturally occurring parts of the terrain. Most famously, there's the mighty Sarlacc of Return of the Jedi, who swallows Boba Fett and dozens of Jabba the Hutt's henchmen. From afar, the Sarlacc looks like nothing more than a huge hole in the ground. But once you get close enough to spot the teeth and the tendrils, you're probably already lunch. Equally sneaky is the gargantuan space slug of Empire Strikes Back, who almost makes a meal of the heroes when Han mistakes the beast's insides for a cave. Then there's the Dianoga, the beast who almost drags Luke to his death in the trash compactor scene of A New Hope, and who mostly appears off-screen. The Rancor, though not exactly as cleverly hidden as the Sarlacc or the space slug, is kept out of sight for its first few scenes in Return of the Jedi. There are also the multiple aquatic giants who threaten the heroes of Phantom Menace as they navigate Naboo's waterways. And then, of course, there's the massive, tentacled Suma Verminoth who tries to devour the Millennium Falcon in Solo. Droids don't do what droids are supposed to do. Or, more commonly, they do what they're supposed to do, but only after complaining about it for a really long time. C-3PO is constantly arguing against the hero's plans, and R2-D2 is usually preoccupied with some secret mission. In Rogue One, K-2 second-guesses all of Cassian's decisions, and sets himself up as the authority on who can and who cannot be trusted. While in Solo, L-3 is more concerned with starting a droid revolution than with being helpful. Ironically, perhaps the best evidence of this is in the rare example of a droid doing what it's supposed to do. In Phantom Menace, R2-D2 is introduced as one of a number of droids who are dispatched to repair Queen Amadella's ship while under fire. R2 is the only droid to survive and manages to fix the ship's hyperdrive. Later, Amadella thanks the droid for its service and orders it to be specially cleaned as a reward. Which means, apparently, a droid doing precisely what it was designed to do is such a rare occurrence in the Star Wars narrative that when it actually happens, any nearby humans feel the need to set up a freaking award ceremony. The Moss Eisley Cantina from A New Hope is the setting of one of the franchise's most well-remembered scenes, and also one of its most replicated. Similar hives of scum and villainy can be found in just about every Star Wars film. Jabba's Palace in Return of the Jedi is basically a larger, grander version of the Moss Eisley Cantina. In one of Attack of the Clones' few genuinely funny moments, Obi-Wan uses his Jedi mind trick to convince a drug dealer in a bar on Coruscant to rethink his path in life. Fittingly, Solo features almost nothing but these places of ill repute, starting with the crime boss Lair Han escapes on Corellia, the casino on Vandor where Han first meets Lando, and later the bar on Numidian Prime where Han finally wins the Millennium Falcon from Lando. Shortly after Han meets Finn and Rey in The Force Awakens, he brings them to Maz Kanata's Cantina-esque castle on Takodana. And while its leader and soldiers were extremist rebels rather than bounty hunters and criminals, Saw Gerrera's stronghold on Jeddah felt a lot like Jabba's palace. Then there are the examples that seem more upscale but are nevertheless just as villainous, like Dryden Voss Yacht in Solo and the casino that caters to the super-rich residents of Canto Bight in The Last Jedi. They're fancy, sure, but that doesn't make them any nicer. A Star Wars movie with no lightsaber fighting is surely no Star Wars movie at all. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. In the earliest films, the duel usually takes place toward the end. Obi-Wan battles Vader in A New Hope, Luke's Empire Strikes Back fight with Vader is perhaps the most iconic of all the duels, and once he's fully trained, Luke proves his skills superior to Vader's in Return of the Jedi. The prequels brought us the manically choreographed battle between Darth Maul, Qui-Gon, and Obi-Wan in Phantom Menace. Obi-Wan and Anakin are both humbled by Count Dooku in Attack of the Clones, though they're saved when Yoda bursts out his crazy lightsaber skills for the first time on screen. Revenge of the Sith was the first film to deliver a duel right at the beginning, a rematch between Anakin and Dooku, along with the Jedi Council's doomed attempt to capture Palpatine, General Grievous' forearmed assault on Obi-Wan, Yoda's fight with Palpatine, and Kenobi's victory over Anakin on Mustafar. 
The Force Awakens was the first time the series portrayed a woman on either side of a lightsaber duel, as Rey takes on Kylo Ren after the latter easily defeats Finn. Weirdly, there's little saber-on-saber -saber action in The Last Jedi. Kylo and Rey fight back-to-back -back against Snoke's elite Praetorian Guard, Finn uses an energy baton rather than a lightsaber when he attacks Phasma, and the Luke who faces Kylo at the end of the film turns out to not have been there in the first place. The only instance in which one lightsaber physically clashes with another actually takes place during a flashback. Star Wars climaxes tend to follow one particular multi-layered formula in the sense that there's usually one main conflict made up of two or three smaller battles. Usually, there's at least one large-scale military clash contrasted against a much more personal one-on-one -on -one fight. Return of the Jedi establishes the formula. On Endor, the Ewoks and the Rebel ground forces fight the Imperial troops to take out the Death Star's shield generators, and in space, the Rebel fleet clashes with the Imperial TIE fighters and Star Destroyers. Meanwhile, on the Death Star, Luke and Vader cross lightsabers one last time. The formula returns in Phantom Menace. The Gungan army faces off against the droids on Naboo, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon have their fateful duel with Darth Maul in the palace, while Naboo fighters battle the Trade Federation's droid ships in space. Likewise, the end of The Force Awakens is split between the Rebel fleet's attempt to take out Starkiller Base and the lightsaber duel in the snow. Rogue One's tragic final clash depicts yet another space battle a large-scale ground assault, and the efforts of Jin, Cassian, and K2SO to find and transmit the Death Star plans. Revenge of the Sith is one of the few entries to not include a huge military battle. Instead, going back and forth between the Obi-Wan and Vader duel on Mustafar and the fight between Yoda and Palpatine on Coruscant. A New Hope's all-out assault on the Death Star actually seems pretty simple in comparison. It turns out all our teachers were wrong. The correct way to count is 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9. Well, at least from a certain point of view. Star Wars is known today as a cultural phenomenon, but it wasn't always seen that way. The original film, A New Hope, was released back in 1977 with little hope of success by even its creator, George Lucas. According to Screen Prism, Lucas was so sure of its failure that when it was released in cinemas, he was hiding out in Hawaii on vacation. But Lucas must have had some belief the movie could be a hit, because buried deep in his mind was a plan to turn what looked like a standalone film into a series of movies. And then something incredible happened. You strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. A New Hope, then simply titled Star Wars, defied the odds and became a mega hit of galactic proportions. A New Hope was followed by The Empire Strikes Back in 1980, and Return of the Jedi came after in 1983 to complete the original Star Wars trilogy. Then, in 1999, a fourth Star Wars film was released. Only, it wasn't a fourth film. It was to be the first one on the Star Wars timeline. The Phantom Menace is, in fact, Episode One. It was succeeded by Episode Two, Attack of the Clones in 2002, and Episode Three, Revenge of the Sith in 2005, to comprise a Star Wars prequel trilogy. More films were released from 2015 to 2019, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker, which were sequels to the original three Star Wars films. But why create them in this order? Why not make the first Star Wars trilogy prequels, then create two separate sequel collections? The answer is a lot simpler than its accompanying question suggests. Author Michael Kaminsky writes in The Secret History of Star Wars that Lucas decided to start with the fourth episode, quote, due to technical and storytelling reasons. He further explained, Lucas had a massive, expensive epic on his hands and divided the story into three separate films. He had also developed a backstory for his elaborate tale, which together totaled six chapters, and sought to make episode four first due to technical and storytelling reasons. When the film by some miracle went into production, it was beset by problems of all kinds, and Lucas was sure it would be a failure, and was shocked when it became the biggest sensation of the year. Lucas himself has corroborated this claim. He admitted, the Star Wars series started out as a movie that ended up being so big that I took each act and cut it into its own movie. When I first did Star Wars, I did it as a big piece. It was like a big script. It was way too big to make into a movie. So I took the first third of it, which is basically the first act, and I turned that into what was the original Star Wars. The story of A New Hope gave no context of the world in the film, throwing viewers straight into the action without any background knowledge. Doing so would later give Lucas the opportunity to go back and provide some context in the prequels. 
From the release of the first Star Wars film, there was talk that Lucas had three trilogies in mind, one of which would be a prequel trilogy that would deal with the political background needed for the Empire to become what it was in the original movie. Lucas always knew he wanted to create an entire galaxy far, far away, not just a standalone film. There's plenty of evidence of that in A New Hope, with references to the Clone Wars, the Jedi Order, and the Kessel Run hinting at an untold story. It took a number of different drafts of the first Star Wars film before the story of Luke Skywalker, a poor farm boy from Tatooine who discovers he has Jedi powers and joins a band of rebels against an evil dictatorship in the form of the Empire, took shape, leaving other characters by the wayside to have their stories told later. Lucas kept them in the bank and put some of his ideas into the film in passing mention to give that backstory. Mace Windy, who became Mace Windu in the final story, and Anakin Starkiller, later Anakin Skywalker, are among the characters who were initially meant to be in the first film in Lucas's early drafts. Both appear in the Star Wars prequels, although Anakin was technically part of the original trilogy given that he eventually transforms into Darth Vader. Lucas had a pretty specific vision in mind for A New Hope. He wanted the film to fade in with audiences, making it feel like they were coming in halfway through a larger story. It would pave the way for Lucas to be able to turn the film into a full movie series, and he already had the groundwork laid for the backstory he would need to tell. But what about the final trilogy of the Skywalker saga, headlined by the powerful young Rey, you might be wondering? Though Lucas already had it set in his mind to make episodes 7 through 9 way back when, he hadn't yet mapped the actual story that would unfold in those three films. What he did know was that he wanted the original three heroes to make a return, according to comicbook.com. The Star Wars series includes some of the biggest blockbusters of all time, due in no small part to the rabid and meticulous fandom that's followed it through the years. Even after a thousand viewings, there are still some things you may have missed in that galaxy far, far away. Here are a few hidden details in Star Wars movies. Lucas Family Cameos George Lucas resisted the temptation to go Hitchcock during the original Star Wars movies and make cameo appearances, but he did allow himself a few indulgences during the prequels. His son and daughter appear in the prequel trilogy. That's Jet Lucas you see in the library in Attack of the Clones, and again kicking clone trooper Burt when the Jedi younglings are attacked during Revenge of the Sith. Lucas himself appears alongside his daughter Katie in the latter film, playing the blue-skinned Baron, not Lewiski Papanoida, who became a regular in the animated Clone Wars series. And speaking of cameos… Boba Fett Unmasked Officially, Star Wars fans didn't get their first look at a helmetless Boba Fett until the second prequel Attack of the Clones. But the guy who played Fett in the original films, Jeremy Bullock, actually showed his face in The Empire Strikes Back. When another actor failed to show up for filming during the shoot, Bullock stepped in to play an Imperial officer who drags Leia away while she's trying to warn Luke about Vader's trap in Bespin. Years later, Bullock returned for another non-Fett cameo, playing the pilot who delivers Obi-Wan Kenobi, Bail Organa, and Yoda to Coruscant in Revenge of the Sith. The Fett legacy doesn't end there, however. Let's see Stormtrooper DNA. Hardcore Star Wars fans know about the Stormtrooper head bump goof up that made it into the final cut of A New Hope. Rather than correct the mistake, George Lucas paid tribute to it when he had the character of Jango Fett, whose DNA was used to create the first Clone Trooper army, whack his head on the door as he climbs into his ship. Clone Troopers were eventually phased out for conscripted Stormtroopers, but some Clone Troopers remained in service. Guess you know who this guy's dad was. Cell Block 1138 Years before embarking on the Star Wars saga, George Lucas made his big screen directorial debut with the 1970 sci-fi feature THX-1138. It wasn't a major commercial success, so many viewers initially missed the significance when Luke Skywalker makes a reference to the Death Star Cell Black 1138 during A New Hope. Where are you taking this thing? Prisoner transfer from Cell Block 1138. Corellian Freighters it's easy to believe that the Millennium Falcon is a one-of-a-kind spaceship. After all, while we saw plenty of X-Wings and TIE Fighters zipping through space, we never got a look at anything like another Falcon. But the truth is that Han Solo's beloved freighter was just one of many in the Corellian YT-1000 line. George Lucas slipped in several of them in the background during the prequels, including a brief shot of the Falcon herself, spotted ducking at Coruscant long before Solo claimed ownership. That's not the only hidden detail featuring the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy. Millennium Falcon's New Dish We don't know much about what happened to the Millennium Falcon after it lost its radar dish in Return of the Jedi. That was too close. But it's obvious that someone did a little repair work along the way. The ship was giving a rectangular replacement that you can clearly see during The Force Awakens. Maybe it was installed by the same person who worked on C-3PO? You probably don't recognize me because of the red arm. Vader's Helmet 
When Palpatine invites Anakin into his private booth during a performance of the Bubble Opera during Revenge of the Sith, the audience already knows the young Jedi will be corrupted into becoming Darth Vader. But to add that extra little bit of nearly subliminal foreshadowing, George Lucas inserted an almost imperceptible glimpse of Vader's helmet into the show. Some viewers swear they can hear what sounds like a couple seconds of Vader breathing way down in the mix. Potato Asteroids for years, rumors have persisted that the Empire Strikes Back FX crew, annoyed by George Lucas's almost impossible demands, decided to strike back by using a potato and a sneaker as asteroids during a Millennium Falcon chase sequence. Years later, it was revealed that the potato story was actually true. An in-joke between workers who developed countless asteroid designs, only to be told that the end result looked like a certain starchy food. Potatoes. <laughs> Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Skywalker sound. There's a lot going on in Coruscant, making it easy for Lucas to sneak in the logo for his Skywalker Sound company during a brief shot of the city in Attack of the Clones. Take a look at the blue circular logo at the top right section of the screen. Busted! Ralph McQuarrie's cameo. George Lucas dreamed up the Star Wars galaxy, but the iconic designs that amazed generations of moviegoers came from designer Ralph McQuarrie. His concept art introduced a number of key elements to the series, and were instrumental in Lucas landing a distribution deal with 20th Century Fox. McQuarrie's presence is felt throughout the saga, but he actually appears in person during a scene in Empire Strikes Back. He can be briefly spotted as a rebel officer walking through the base of Hoth. R2-KT the pink version of R2-D2, R2-KT, was originally a fan community project designed to help lift the spirits of Katie Johnson, a young Star Wars enthusiast who'd been diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. Dreamed up by her dad as a way of giving Katie a bit of comfort during her final days, the droid received her official live-action feature film debut during The Force Awakens, making brief appearances during scenes set on the Resistance base. I guess that's hope for humanity after all. What were the prisoners making on Arkina 5? The season finale of Andor has a post credit stinger you may have missed, which answers that very question. Keep watching to find out all the details. Disney's Andor occupies a special place in the Star Wars timeline. The prequel movies, ending with Revenge of the Sith, see the bureaucratic Galactic Republic corrupted and taken over from within by an individual using emergency rules and parliamentary edicts designed to consolidate power. Of course, by the time Star Wars A New Hope comes around, the Republic has been replaced by the Empire, which uses fear tactics and overwhelming firepower to suppress dissent. The most infamous example of this is the Death Star, a massive space structure capable of destroying planets and being occasionally mistaken for moons. Andor is nestled in the time before the original Star Wars trilogy and after the prequels. Andor itself is a prequel to Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which sees Cassian Andor and Jyn Erso make a faithful sacrifice in order to deliver the plans for the Death Star to the Rebel Alliance. And the movie pretty much ends exactly where A New Hope picks up, with Darth Vader pursuing the ship of Princess Leia. Now that Andor has completed its first season, the ending stinger helps bring a greater focus to this era of Star Wars history, and it certainly gives Cassian a very specific reason to hate the Empire and its superweapons. Andor starts with small enough stakes, as Cassian looks for any clues to the location of his lost sister on the planet of Morlana 1. Unfortunately, he is shaken down by two security officers, which results in Cassian killing both. This starts off a localized hunt for Cassian, though soon the Empire gets involved when it's revealed that Cassian had access to an Imperial Starpath unit, an exceptionally hard-to-get item that would allow one to track Imperial vessels. Although Cassian wants nothing to do with Rebels, he accepts a job on Aldani which involves stealing the Imperial payroll for an entire sector. Completing his task, Cassian receives his massive payday and decides to lay low. Unfortunately, Imperial forces are engaged in a galaxy-wide crackdown, and he is charged as a vandal even though he is innocent. Given a six-year prison sentence, Cassian is sent to Narkina 5, an Imperial prison and industrial complex. Forced to work on some unknown project, Cassian and his fellow inmates are kept in line by an electrified floor. Eventually, it becomes known that none of the prisoners are getting a chance to leave, even after their sentences are up, which causes Cassian to organize a successful escape. Two episodes later, and after a bombastic finale, it's finally revealed what Cassian and his fellow inmates were working on, the original Death Star. This Stinger post credit scene at the end of the first season of Andor establishes just how the Empire is able to create its fearsome planet-destroying weapon. By utilizing prisoners that may or may not be innocent, the Empire is able to create a workforce that cannot complain, quit, leave, or even tell others what they are working on, which would endanger the Empire's doctrine of ruling through secrets and fear. As noted by The Sun, the original Death Star measures around 75 miles wide, which for the math inclined, results in a volume of 32 quadrillion, 515 trillion, 31 billion, 575 million, 312,203 cubic feet. 
These numbers certainly illustrate just how much effort had to go into the clandestine project and how long the Empire had been working on the planet killer. It's also important to remember that the original design for the Death Star came from the Geonosians during the events of Attack of the Clones. Another aspect to consider involving the construction of the Death Star is that by the Empire utilizing prison labor, they are able to harness a tremendous amount of labor that the Empire doesn't need to worry about talking. This is probably another reason why none of the other prisoners on Arkina 5 are allowed to leave. The Empire doesn't want to risk anybody putting together what their project is. This makes sense, considering that planet-killing weapons are probably a tough sell to all but the most stringent of Imperial supporters and citizens. This reveal, though currently unknown to Cassian, certainly helps establish some of his motivation in Rogue One. Cassian, throughout Season 1 of Andor, certainly isn't committed to the Rebel Alliance cause. He simply wants to get paid, settle his debts, find his sister, and be left in peace. Though he doesn't love the Empire in any sense, he certainly isn't trying to take down the oppressive regime. Of course, by the time Season 2 rolls around, Cassian will be much more dedicated to the cause, especially considering what his adoptive mother Marva said in a recorded message after her death. The teaser scene featuring droids putting the Death Star together at the end of Andor, and the fact that Cassian had been working on the Death Star the entire time was something that the series had always been building towards. Speaking with Polygon, showrunner Tony Gilroy said, we came up with the prison and the building of the part pretty early on. It was like, oh, they should be building the Death Star. And then, you know, you follow it forward and it's like, oh, you know what? We ought to show that. So the visual effects department just loved that idea and they ran with it. Still, it will be interesting to see where Season 2 of Andor leads and how much Cassian will change over the upcoming course of events before the events of Rogue One. With seven main saga installments, an anthology movie, and numerous television releases and animated spin-offs, Star Wars is undoubtedly one of the biggest Hollywood properties ever. However, just being a Star Wars movie isn't enough to guarantee success, and there have definitely been some missteps along the way. We're looking at you, Lumpy. Here's a look back at all the movies that are part of the massive phenomenon that is Star Wars, as we rank them in order from worst to best. Star Wars – The Clone Wars While 2008's Star Wars The Clone Wars made history as the first fully animated Star Wars feature-length film, it isn't great. Essentially a TV pilot packaged for the big screens, it was almost universally panned by critics and audiences. With a script filled with stilted dialogue and forced tension, The Clone Wars just wasn't suited for the big screen. Nevertheless, it succeeded at the box office and worked as a vehicle to introduce audiences to Cartoon Network's The Clone Wars animated series, which went on to be extremely popular. Star Wars Holiday Special Until The Clone Wars came along, 1978's infamous Star Wars Holiday Special reigned as the absolute worst Star Wars movie. The show starts with 10 minutes of untranslated Wookiee dialogue with no Han Solo around to translate it, and then things go bizarrely downhill from there. Segments include a B. Arthur musical number, humorless comedy bits, cameos by Hollywood stars, and an appearance by the rock band Jefferson Starship because, well, their name has the word Starship in it. The one bright spot of the holiday special is a cartoon introducing the character of Boba Fett, but the rest is like watching a slow-motion train wreck. For his part, George Lucas later claimed, If I had the time and a sledgehammer, I would track down every copy of that show and smash it. At least we know what he'll be doing during his retirement. The Ewok Adventure While the Star Wars Holiday Special has a mostly nonsensical plot, the simplistic sci-fi fairy tale in 1984's The Ewok Adventure at least has a beginning, middle, and end. This key difference, as well as the massively better production values, push it past the much maligned 1978 special. Still, after it aired on November 25, 1984, the reviews were lukewarm at best which isn't surprising given the young target audience. But they weren't done with Ewoks just yet. Ewoks – The Battle for Endor The Ewok Adventure was the first of two spin-off films set on Endor. The 1985 sequel, Ewoks – The Battle for Endor, continues the tale begun in the first TV movie, but with a slightly meatier and more serious plot. Like its predecessor, The Battle for Endor won an Emmy, had a brief overseas theatrical run, and made it onto home media in various forms. The Battle for Endor is marginally better than the Ewok adventure, but even with its stronger plot, this sequel isn't deep enough to make a lasting impression, even with an ornery Wilford Brimley. Episode 1 – The Phantom Menace In 1999, the hype surrounding the new Star Wars prequel trilogy was off the charts. Unfortunately, Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, was a complete letdown, even for many of the young fans it was geared towards. 
Did George Lucas really think that kids would want to watch a movie about embargoes, taxation, and political intrigue? While visually impressive, The Phantom Menace gets lost in its own narrative. And that's even before Jar Jar Binks shows up. Don't do that again. There are a few saving graces in The Phantom Menace. Namely, Ian McDermott's performance as Palpatine, just about everything with Darth Maul, and the battle on Naboo are bright spots in an otherwise pretty dull movie. It's not the bottom of the barrel, but The Phantom Menace is clearly the worst of the main Skywalker saga films so far. Episode 2 – Attack of the Clones Following The Phantom Menace, fans crossed their fingers that Lucas could manage to pull things together for the next installment. If there's one thing we can say for Attack of the Clones, it's that it's better than The Phantom Menace. It has some of the more entertaining action sequences seen thus far in the entire saga. The fight between Obi-Wan and Jango Fett on Kamino and the later battle scene on Geonosis are wonderful examples of action done right. But even with all those positives, what really hurts this movie more than anything is the awful dialogue. You could even call it unbelievably bad, but only if you haven't seen The Phantom Menace. Also, this scene of Anakin riding a cow-shaped watermelon didn't help one bit. Episode 3 – Revenge of the Sith A modern rewatch of Revenge of the Sith allows its good points to shine through, without being clouded by the hate that was associated with the prequels back during its initial release. To start with, the film is much darker than most of the other Star Wars films, being first in the saga to garner a well-deserved PG-13 rating. Many of those dark moments, like Order 66 and the Jedi Purge, are surprisingly brutal. Additionally, the lightsaber battles in Revenge of the Sith are more exciting and better choreographed than any that came before. Paired with John Williams' amazing score, the battles between Obi-Wan and Anakin and between Yoda and Sidious are some of the most impressive in the entire franchise. As the third film in a trilogy, Sith also ties up Anakin's arc with his transformation to Vader. Yes, it suffers from the same rough dialogue and overacting as the rest of the prequels, but Revenge of the Sith stands solidly as the best of that series. Episode 6 – Return of the Jedi Yes, Return of the Jedi is a classic, and fans who grew up with the original films don't like to admit many of its faults. But that doesn't mean those faults don't exist. The most glaring of those has to be the indoor section, at least where the Ewoks are involved. And while Han's rescue at the beginning of the film is very enjoyable, especially the comic relief provided by Han's blindness, the Tatooine scene tends to drag on a little too long. Although many fans felt a little cheated by the rehashing of the Death Star plot, the space battle around the Death Star turned out to be one of the best in the history of the franchise. And you can't argue too hard against the story's closure, especially watching Vader come full circle and regain his humanity. At the end of the day, Return of the Jedi is a solid, enjoyable, and flawed part of the Star Wars saga, no matter which version you're watching. Rogue One – A Star Wars Story Rogue One stands mostly on its own merits. It doesn't rely on too many familiar characters and allows Disney and Lucasfilm to explore new stories in the galaxy that don't revolve around the Skywalker family and their pals. At its heart, Rogue One is a war movie, not a typical Star Wars space opera. It's filled with great action sequences and a cast of supporting characters that you actually start to care about. Additionally, it gives us yet another believable and strong female hero in Jin Erso. On the negative side, some of the dialogue is clunky, and the CGI used to create Grand Moff Tarkin and Princess Leia ventures into Uncanny Valley more than once. That said, these are mostly minor issues with what is overall a very solid Star Wars film. Episode 7 – The Force Awakens when Lucasfilm and Disney first announced plans for a new Star Wars trilogy, fans were apprehensive that we'd get another run of prequels. Thankfully, the producers and director J.J. Abrams pulled out all the stops, resulting in one of the best movies in the entire saga. There's no question that The Force Awakens justifies the hype. It appeals to fans old and new alike. The new characters are all excellent additions to the franchise. The showdown between Han and Kylo and the final lightsaber battle in the woods are two major standout scenes. The major downside is that much of the characters and plot of The Force Awakens parallel A New Hope, especially Rey's arc and the Death Star stand-in, Starkiller Base. That aside, it's still an excellent entry into the Star Wars series, with a familiar yet fresh story and a new cast of faces ready to take the saga forward. Episode 8 – The Last Jedi Director Ryan Johnson definitely didn't play it safe with his first crack at the Star Wars saga. Instead, he delivered a visually stunning and narratively satisfying film that echoes the darkness of The Empire Strikes Back without being chained to its legacy. 
Although The Last Jedi has earned almost universal critical acclaim, it isn't a perfect movie. Some of the subplots could have done with some trimming down, and several of the more comedic moments were jarring. That said, the movie also provides excellent character development and absolutely jaw-dropping action scenes, which help make up for its shortcomings. Episode 5 – The Empire Strikes Back After the amazing success of A New Hope, George Lucas had a near-impossible task ahead of him when it came to making a sequel to such a worldwide sensation. Fortunately, The Empire Strikes Back was a resounding success. Darker and more intense than the original, The Empire Strikes Back suffers only for the lack of a clear beginning or ending to the story. And even in that regard, it's hard to fault the film. The second story in a trilogy is always the hardest to get right. And for many fans, the second installment was the best. Regardless, The Empire Strikes Back is an indispensable film, both within the Star Wars universe and for the science fiction genre as a whole. Episode 4 – A New Hope with so many things in life, you can't top the original, and that applies even to Star Wars. Ever since its theatrical release four decades ago, A New Hope has reigned supreme as the best Star Wars movie. This isn't just nostalgia talking. A New Hope broke ground in so many ways and still stands up to a critical viewing today. While at its heart, A New Hope is a traditional underdog tale of good versus evil, the way that George Lucas tells this story in the framework of a galaxy far, far away made cinematic history. Never before had a science fiction film been approached with the grimy and aged look that Star Wars had, and Lucas's team brought new model-making and photographic advances to the movie industry with their work on A New Hope. Beyond the historic significance of the film, the original Star Wars is a great movie in terms of story, pacing, and action. Not only is A New Hope the best movie in the Star Wars franchise, it still stands as one of the best films of all time. Jabba the Hutt isn't just a crime boss. As far as the Star Wars universe is concerned, he is the boss. But Jabba is so much more than just a lazy, corrupt blob. He's got a history that's just as gross and bizarre as his slime-coated skin. Here are a few things you might not know about Jabba de Silagic Chire. Jabba de Silagic Chire. Jabba de Sidjigbir. Jabba the Hutt. A slimy evolution. Jabba the Hutt is famous for his bulbous body and slug like features. In the decades since his debut in Return of the Jedi, he's become a symbol for gluttony and corruption. And it's all thanks to his disgusting, pulsating bod. But Jabba could have looked very different. In the original Star Wars script, he's simply ambiguously described big and gross, with facial scars from vicious battles. In the original concept art, he's vaguely Chewbacca-like and stands on two legs, and in the Marvel Comics Star Wars adaptation, he's a yellow humanoid with a snout and bushy mutton chops. It was only when Return of the Jedi entered pre-production that Jabba started to take his now-familiar form. But bringing a giant slug like Jabba to life was a major production. In Return of the Jedi, there were three main puppeteers, and other performers moved his eyes and helped animate his tail. Larry Ward, who also voiced Greedo, provided the vocals. Over the years, a lot of people have played Jabba. Declan Mulholland played the first rudely human Jabba the Hutt in a scene that was ultimately cut from the original Star Wars. Veteran actor Ed Asner played Jabba in a radio drama. And in The Clone Wars, he's played by Kevin Michael Richardson. Several different actors have voiced him in video games. And in The Phantom Menace, he's credited as being played by himself. Figure that one out. Mommy Issues Jabba is a mobster from a family of mobsters, so of course his family reunions get a little complicated. In 2008, the animated film The Clone Wars introduced Jabba's uncle, Zero the Hutt, and his son, the flatulent Rhoda. Later, the cartoon series expanded Jabba's family tree by bringing in other family members, including the obese Hutt matriarch Mama. Jabba's parents don't play a big on-screen role, although they clearly had an impact on the young Hutt. According to the Star Wars character encyclopedia, one of Jabba's dancers, Yarna Dalgargan, was made in his mother's image. If she seems a little hut-like, that's not an accident. As the character encyclopedia explains, Jabba had Yarna's body enlarged and forces her to wear makeup that makes her look like his mom. Yes, it's all a little weird, even for Jabba. Still, twisted parent-kid relationships are kind of a Star Wars thing, and it wouldn't be the first time we've seen characters in a galaxy far, far away getting a little too close to their family members. How to Speak Hut You can't actually learn Huttese because it's not a real language. It is, however, based on one. 
On the DVD commentary track for A New Hope, Lucasfilm sound designer Ben Burt says he based Huttese on Quechua, a collection of loosely affiliated South American languages that date back to ancient Incan times. As the story goes, Burt located an instructional tape and played it for Larry Ward, who used the sounds to create Huttese words for Jabba. Huttese isn't actually Quechua. It has no formal structure. Not that anyone on set would have noticed. During filming, Jabba's puppeteers delivered all his lines in English. The Hatiz was added in post-production, and it was designed to fit Jabba's already filmed mouth movements. Your mind powers will not work on me, boy. Dude looks like a lady. Hut physiology is really freaking weird. According to reference books like The New Essential Guide to Alien Species, huts don't have skeletons, although they do have a mantle that helps give their heads that distinct blobby shape. They sweat mucus and they have snake-like qualities too. In the 1995 comic Jabba the Hutt, The Dynasty Trap, Jabba is seen swallowing an entire human. And while Jabba has a son, don't go looking for Mrs. Hutt. She doesn't exist. In Star Wars' old continuity, huts were born with both male and female reproductive organs and could choose to mate with themselves. According to the novelization of Star Wars The Clone Wars, that's exactly what Jabba did. In 2012, though, after Disney purchased Lucasfilm, the Mouse House wiped most of Star Wars' non-film continuity clean. As part of this reshuffling, the huts got definitive genders. Jabba's hermaphroditic past is gone. For better or worse, he's now a dude, and only a dude. Tats for Huts. Jabba's arm tattoo wasn't supposed to be important. It was supposed to look cool. In an interview with Sci-Fi Now, John Coppinger, the man who sculpted Jabba, said the tattoo was really just a meaningless afterthought. I put a tattoo onto Jabba's arm as a finishing touch. Now, if you Google Jabba tattoo, there you'll find yards of information about Hutti's tribal markings. In the novel Darth Plagueis, Jabba's tattoo is implied to be the symbol of his clan, a crime family known just as much for their fearsome loyalty as for their greed, their opulent tastes, and their fondness for humanoid women. Hey, at least Jabba's comfortable in his own gross, slimy skin. You can't say that about a lot of people. He doesn't feel the need to be charming or anything. He's just an unpretentious, very straightforward guy.